set? Thank you. Welcome to the Planning Board meeting of July 9th, 2018. We um, have a little bit of business that we can start with at 7.30. Um, our first hearing is at 7.45. So um, the first thing I wanted to do was, um, I see Mark in the audience. Are you here to talk about Zach ideas? Yeah, or? You're just on the off chance that that's what you're uh, wanting to talk about. Okay, all right. So let's start with that because we, Gary was not at the meeting and he had, he had uh, told me ahead of time that he really wanted to be part of that discussion. Um, we do have it on the agenda to more completely <coughs> formally discuss next time on the 23rd. Um, so we wanted to get Gary's general input, early input, on, and then yours certainly, Mark, and I appreciate that you're here. Truly. Okay. Take us away. Well, and again, I apologize I missed that meeting, but um, I did um, enjoy watching it while on vacation in Costa Rica. Um, <laughs> definitely some really good discussion. And I, again, I just wanted to kind of add my comments. Um, I did serve on Zach uh, last year, so that was my first year on it. Um, and I agree with a lot of the comments that people made, um, but just wanted to add a little bit of additional perspective. Um, and this is based largely on the fact that, to me, Zach is really the, the planning arm of the of the planning board um, and so I think that there are some things that I observed or things that um, you know I think that, that we might be able to improve upon um, so I know there was a lot of discussion on the number of people um, in my opinion and I, I fully appreciate the the desire and, and the need for diversity but I'd also argue that I think that, that you can achieve a very diverse uh, set of perspectives with nine people and I think that, that given uh, the function of the ZAC, um, and um, you know, I, I think that, that in order to, to help it run efficiently and to really maximize its output, I personally wouldn't want any more than nine people. I just think that that really helps it move, helps it work more efficiently. Um, I, do, um, I do like the idea of um, non-voting members. I think it was Amy that brought that up. I really like that uh, idea. That's a way to backfill people. It's also a way to give some experience for people that maybe otherwise haven't had it. Um, I also like the idea of uh, requiring ZAC members to be um, uh, residents of, of Hopkinton. Um, um, you know, I, one other point I wanted to make too is that I, I think that all of our boards in town do a really good job of encouraging public engagement. And so I know there's a lot of discussion about Zach being a good entry point for people that haven't had a lot of experience in, in town government. Um, you don't have to be on a board to be engaged and to participate. So, um, you know, I know that, that a lot of us go to planning or not planning board meetings, but board meetings that or committee meetings that maybe we're not a member of. But every time I've been, there's almost always a desire and a willingness for people to, to provide input from the public. And I think that's a way to overcome those beliefs that maybe this is a, a, good, a good learning channel. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's still plenty of ways to, to engage. Um, let's check my notes here. Um, I agree, I like the idea of making Zach year round, um, maybe less frequent in the off season, but, but again, if we really want to make it a planning uh, group, then I, I don't think we want to feel that pressure or that rush to sort of squeeze things in, which is definitely what happened last year. Um, so, um, you know, and, and then the last thing I think is the other benefit of it being year-round is I think that allows us to be a little bit more proactive. Um, last year I felt we were largely reactive, which we have to do, but, you know, either from the, the Board of Appeals, uh, from the Chamber of Commerce, and I think some of the bigger issues that residents brought up that, that I know I wanted to talk about, we never were able to even talk about those things because mm -hmm. they're more complicated, because they're harder. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I thought, I just felt like there was a missed opportunity. So, my you. thoughts. Uh, I appreciate that. Mark, how about you, early thoughts? Um, so, you know, we've spoken informally mm -hmm. a bit before and, and we chatted also at the, um, at the last ZBA meeting. Um, I think uh, I'd echo a lot of what Gary just said. I mean, I think the um, the 20 member board was just way too unwieldy. Um, I, I like the idea of, of non-voting members maybe to to uh, add a little um, extra uh, extra diversity to the group, maybe keep the voting numbers small so you don't end up having an issue with quorum. Um, I haven't thought about it extensively, but you know, with ZBA we have. You know the five full members and then the four associates and maybe 
some concept like that could work for an ongoing ZAC committee. Um, maybe nine, nine, four, five, something like that. But um, you know, I, I definitely think it. Nine, I, I would say, is not an unreasonable number, but seven could be fine. Mm -hmm. Eleven could be fine. Something less than um, yeah. the large number, yeah. and perhaps um, in the same context, some. Um, you know, a little more um, provision or um, perhaps just a, attention to um, the ability to um, get folks to resign if they've decided they don't want to continue anymore, then drop them from the quorum requirement. Yeah. Um, that was a big problem. There were several folks that came once and then didn't come again. Right. Um, yeah. That still pumps up yeah. against quorum. Um, so, Meryl, if I could just add. Yeah. I, for, I meant to look this up earlier, but I just finally did it tonight. So in 2016, there were nine people on Zach. In 2015, there were 13 people. And in 2014, there were 10. So, so anyway, that, so in that range, yeah, it's, it's like always, a good it's size. Yeah, it's always been in the, in the yeah. you know, the seven to nine to maybe 11 range. Um, right. Last year was a bit, was just oh, I agree. a bigger return on, on invitation. Mm -hmm. um, and we've never had to um, sort of craft a, you know, a, people. a job description kind of thing, or a, you know, some sort of criteria by which we might um, choose one person over another if we have 20 applicants for nine or 11 seats. And that's part of, part of how we got hung up last year as a board, just speaking for myself and my recollection of it, is that we were under the gun schedule-wise. Um, we had all these applicants, and by uh, precedent, we had always taken all comers. And we didn't have criteria set aside to choose people, interview and choose people. Not for nothing, we didn't have time to, and we hadn't set aside time to interview people either, so all those things. But go ahead, Mara, I did it. Oh, I, th I think, just to build on that, I, I think that's something you'll have to think about mm -hmm. if you continue towards an, an, a more year-round mm -hmm. um, ZAC as well. I mean, you're, you're going to want to have a little more um, yeah, uh, input from folks before you put them on that that uh, board uh, committee with a you know, bit of a larger role. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other, um, the other thought I just wanted to, um, to chime in was uh, part of the, uh, the idea of um, taking Zach into a, into a more year-round approach, I think, dovetails well with the idea of doing a more comprehensive review of the bylaw, mm -hmm. the zoning bylaw. Um, I think it's a great idea. It's certainly, one I know you're you're planning to talk about more in terms of getting professional review uh -huh. uh, potentially, and that's a longer term, maybe two three years project. But um, it's something that Zach would be well suited to to have a large role in. Um, and again, you want to probably not take all comers for that. Right. Uh, you want folks that um, have some experience with you know with zoning, with uh, the issues that are going to come up with. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Anybody else um, on the, just the tee up for Zach? So I, I did have another. Yep, go ahead. So the idea of, could we, since we create this committee, could we make a rule that if somebody misses three meetings, they're automatically removed? We can definitely talk about we have, that. We I can, don't want to. That's, that's a parameter. We yeah. can, we can, we can yeah, yeah, we can set, yeah. Or we can, very often, we, we kind of want to ask somebody, right? Because we, we and, in the end, we have no idea what happens in somebody's experience, which precludes them from following through on something they said they were going to. So there, it behooves us to be a little bit sensitive in that and make sure we reach out to people and find out what's going on and whether or not they're going to be able to stay with it and that kind of thing, in my mind, anyway. Because I yeah. think to, to, to that point, I mean, a lot of these people that do participate or volunteer, it's the first time that they have engaged. So. Sometimes life intervenes and things happen, but I think if you kind of define up front, here's what it's going to be a year round program, like Mark is usually does. I think the group is very amenable to that. Um, you kind of set the stage for what those expectations are. It will help determine or help identify those folks, uh, either with the experience or willingness to kind of serve. We can add either associate or a voting member, however that may be. I think the other big thing about that is there are issues that, from my experience, have kind of staggered from year to year to year. For whatever reason, there's been no consensus or it just really hasn't come to a place where they've been able to present it back to the planning board. I think of things like lighting, signage, some of those things that just perpetually kind of hang out there. And I think 
a year round, you, and they're the ones that always get squeezed out when you've got some key ones that have to be decisioned and brought forth to the planning board. I think we'll have a much more robust opportunity to look at those things. And I think, you know, again, to Mark's point, if you're looking at somebody to review some of those bylaws, bring those in at appropriate time so it's not kind of a rushed um, okay. package that is brought right. forth. So that would be um, that would be great. And I also want to check the I, I, I'll take this action item. I want to check the um, master plan because I believe that there is an action item in there for exactly that sort of comprehensive zoning bylaw review. And uh, we want to start with the master plan that was just revised before we. Madam well, Chair, I have the 2017 master plan. I do as well. Yeah. You. <laughs> Not that we take the time now. Yeah, but um, but just to make sure we're <laughs> swimming in concert with what the master plan sets out as well. Um, so thinking about next, uh, that we have this on the agenda, Mark, and we, I would very much appreciate if you were available to come um, next next uh, meeting on the 23rd, which is at 9:15. Unfortunately, not a hugely convenient time. Um, and I wanted to wa ask uh, the fellow, my fellow board members, if we should specifically invite. Um, other folks like um, the Board of Selectmen if somebody wanted to come, uh, the CONCOM if somebody wanted to come, the Chamber if somebody wanted to come um, to uh, join us in the conversation. I, I think that's a great idea, mm -hmm. a great request. I, I, I know that uh, the, the previous chairman of the ZAC for a number of years, they would probably behoove us to get his input to mm -hmm. extend, <laughs> extend the offer. I agree. Um, so if we can just make sure we reach out to folks and let them know when we'll be talking about this, mm -hmm. um, that would be really helpful. Um, is there anybody else we should specifically invite? So I have Chamber of Commerce, ComCom, and Zach. And the Board of Selectmen. So I, I, mean, I, mean, yeah. I would suggest last year, Zach, I mean, you've got a, a collection of folks who yeah. already are, yeah. are interested. I mean, yeah, that's a, a good a idea. He's a cross-section in the room already. Yeah. But. yeah, I appreciate that suggestion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know if they will come, but why not invite them? That would be, that makes great sense. Um, okay, Mark, thanks so much. Um, appreciate sure. it. Appreciate Georgia, it. did oh. you um, did you get the Mr. Ferrari was one of the people we suggested reaching out to? I think Fran so, suggested that. Oh yeah, great yeah, I've reached, okay. I've reached out to him personally about getting us some info on this. But if we want to invite him, that would be great. Actually, that's a great reminder. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so thinking about the discussion, I have some broad uh, reminders. So the size of the committee, terms if we do a year round, um, um, membership if we want to establish particular um, members on the committee like a representative from the Board of Appeals, um, criteria for the appointments, um, and um, I have written here too, um, <coughs> A methodology for the planning board to be more active in the direction that we provide um, and then I would think that the other item that people sh m might like to contribute at that discussion it are um, do you have anything on your list of agenda items that you would like to the Zach to take up are there some obvious um, topics we'd want the upcoming Zach to uh, keep in the mix contemplating to start with I would okay. add one thing. Yes. And that would be training for new um, ZAC members. Um, when Great I, idea. I joined last year as a new member, and I didn't know what I didn't know, so I couldn't go out searching for it ahead of time. Um, it's just I landed on the committee, and, and I learned for, through the course of the first few meetings what we did and how it happened. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, the first few meetings weren't particularly productive from, from that standpoint. Right. I agree. You know, I, I, I as well feel that um, as that criteria is developed, that we really need a job definition, like a description exactly what exactly to try to accomplish, you know, at least a rough outline. And then, but what I really like is what, um, what Amy has sort of brought forth is these alternate positions so that it doesn't create this big pressure on, on people, maybe non voting members, whether they want to perhaps show up that day mm -hmm. or whether they have to um, or they want to participate in the issue that's being brought up that day. So it's a little bit looser, looser mm -hmm. woven mm -hmm. for people who want to just get a touch of what's happening. 
um, and be a part of it, um, that might be a really good solution. Um, and I, I thought, so far, I'm really happy with that alternate position that's been provided to us. So if we extend that to others, I think that can, can I just add one comment to that? I, I, the only thing that makes me a little bit nervous is if we're already telling them that they don't need to be at every meeting. Um, if, you, if, you can't, if you're not going to commit to that level, then I think that you can still participate as a member of the public. And I, I don't think we want to set that precedent that, um, you know, that they can kind of pick and choose what meetings they go to if they're going to serve in an official capacity. Well, maybe it's not necessarily an official capacity. Maybe the alternate is someone who sort of wants to get their feet wet. And and um, and maybe there's a few issues they can point out, but I think they have to. I think they would have to publicly say, you know, I want to take, I want to be involved in the master plan and make sure they sort of participate throughout the process. So maybe it's one issue or. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Sorry, I have one more thought. Yeah, no, it's sort of the opposite of what Gary was saying. But <coughs> on, the on the ap application, maybe there could be a, they could ha have an option for they would like to be a full member or alternate or either. Because some people might say, they're very interested in lighting and they really want to come to all those meetings, <coughs> but they can't commit to coming all year because of their schedule or something. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, uh, everything, for my estimation, everything is kind of on the table. Yeah. as we try and um, structure something. And then just a cautionary note that I've thought about is that this first year is going to be very much paced like last year and years previous because of the schedule. So we're, we're really, this is a long game that we want this to be more efficient in years out a little bit and to temper our expectations for a big change in functionality this first year kind of thing. Yes, it, it's it or bit. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, there's a couple of things you can probably get done this first year. Yeah. But then if you have a, a master plan to what the mm -hmm. what that could look like, you build upon that year upon year. Yeah, and I I, I personally envision, you know, uh, topics that carry forward. We can't we couldn't get this done this year, but it's we're working it and we're going to carry it forward to for to next year. Yeah. For example, like what does it mean to be a dark side community? Uh -huh. and, and how do we define that in commercially and residentially? Uh -huh. um, and I think it's a fascinating com um, concept that could take a few years to really figure out. Like, what does it mean to do that on Main Street? What does it mean to do it on Hayden Row? Um, I'm going to actually have to excuse, uh, step okay, in here and just take a motion to open the public hearing, the continued public hearing for 1700 Wilson Street and Cedar Street. Um, and continue it to such time that the applicant arrives. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. All those in favor? Are they are they here? I don't know. I do not see them. They, they had called and said that they were were racing here. Yeah. So we didn't necessarily expect them on time. As of a little while ago. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, so we have, we, we can take that, that business as soon as they come when we open that um, <clears throat> public hearing, um, but we might as well keep talking. I would like to take up my most urgent conversation. <laughs> we have to have a different meeting space, I'm sorry to say. I'm allergic to the, this facility. I cough when I want to come in here. The cleaning products make me, and so we, the town hall is now open again. Yeah, Town Hall officially opens on the 18th. Um, so, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, well, I, you know, I kind of trotted around town to find people. I'm like, when did that happen? <laughs> yeah, that was going on. <laughs> yeah, I, it's news to me. So, um, so, Town Hall is opening. That's exciting news. I would like to ask the board if we could uh, move our meetings to um, the meeting room in Town Hall that we typically use. Back to the same old one code? We, we, don't, we don't have that. Oh, oh, is there a room we can use? I just learned that the other day. We would have a thing confirm that no one has a standing meeting time in that room, right? Uh, right. You know, the board of selectmen always met us in the board of selectmen. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Be two the basement, right? Or the library. The basement. Library. I, yeah, there are or other buildings that I'm yeah. fine. Or the senior center. I don't care. I just, it's senior ridiculous. Senior center has kind of started to. Yeah. They would like to get out of the they business like and having meetings. meetings. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. I can find what buildings are available. Yeah. So it does. It challenges us for next time because we won't be able to continue to a site specific. I think. Yeah. 
Um, so looking forward to the August meeting. 27th. Um, if we could have a spot, a, uh, a meeting room certain for our meetings, that would be really helpful. Here, I just wanted to add that each camp can only televise live in certain rooms. That's right. So, so they have to tape room. it in then. It the, could be the selectman room or the high school library or, or here. Yeah. So I would prefer yeah. that we be li stay live if it's possible. Mm -hmm. I, I don't actually have a preference on that. I do have a preference for taping so people can access the meetings. Mm -hmm. But um, the high school library, the selectman's meeting room, mm -hmm. and you said one more. In here. Here. Uh, not the um, not the middle school middle library. School library well, I think they moved the school committee set up. The school committee now meets in the high school library. So because because it couldn't be live. Oh, no, I think they moved the live equipment from one place to the oh, other. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, yeah. I see. Okay. And the school, so, she can't meet during vacations unless we pay for the independent custodians. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have a preference, it would appear, yeah. <laughs> for the um, selectman's meeting room if it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, I just am not willing to lay down my life for this. <laughs> <laughs> I smell it. So. Yeah, it, it, it bothers me every single time. So, um, you know, I kind of thought that maybe it was just... Um, we just go one time. Yeah, yeah, we just. Maybe it's Fran. Last <laughs> 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 year, I should sit over here. <laughs> I, I can. I know it's the a cleaning I'm process. As soon as I get, I get into the elevator, maybe it's because it's in the basement and there isn't. It doesn't look like there's a lot of ventilation. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, I apologize for being so overly sensitive in my personal needs. <laughs> so, um, so if we can be televised live, that is preferable. Um, if we, we certainly do not want to pay for the privilege of a meeting room when we do meet during the summers consistently, so it would be better if we had um, a meeting room that was uh, almost always available to us with rare exception that could be televised. Otherwise, we'll have to suck it up and uh, be taped and then televised. But. One question, is, the, is Town Hall now air conditioned? It is. It is. <laughs> so that yeah. open space up at the top left, that's closed in now. Mm. Okay. Before it was an open, mm -hmm. so that's all closed in. Yeah. I, the selectman's meeting room is not air conditioned, I don't think. <laughs> I, I was advised, for what it's worth, that we should not meet there over the summer. Yes, well, we're almost, we're, we're, by the time we start, August it's going to be August 25th. I'm just saying, it's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll just so have next to, summer. Yep, yep. <laughs> we'll bring everybody a little fan, a little sprinkler, you know, whatever. <laughs> whatever you have to do. A drone. <laughs> uh, but that would be really helpful. So next meeting will be here yep. because we'll ha we have to know a place certain. Yeah. And we are scheduled for here for next time. But mm -hmm. if looking forward, we could move the places. Yeah. That would be helpful. All right, I got that. Cross that right off my list. Um, he's going to just dash right in when he arrives, right? I could call him, but... No, that's all right. Um, so, uh, we cannot do this business until 9 o'clock, but we do have a continued public hearing for um, the minor project on West Main Street, the global gas station project. Um, my suggestion when we get to that point in time we have to continue it tonight because we have to have five voting members and one of our voting members is not available tonight of the five that can vote on that um, and so my suggestion is to uh, take a page out of what the Board of Appeals does and the CONCOM does and uh, move it to 735 we have Buckland Street Leonard Street at 730 and move global to 735 in case we can't move forward with um, Buckland. Um, we way. don't waste that time, yeah. and then we will we still continue with it. So that's my idea for, yeah. for that. Um, we did, oh, the applicant is here. So we did talk, um, I did do a little investigating about that approach, and there is a, there's an upside and a downside. It's convenience for the board, but all of the applicants and all of their um, their paid consultants um, are waiting Sticking for the entire out. night, and it is it is costly for applicants. So I think that with um, we can uh, utilize that approach with some As thoughtfulness. Yeah. yeah. Discretion. So do they inform the uh, all town that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. They know. Um, and uh, so is it Frank that's missing? Yes. Frank yeah. 
Frank is missing time. Who are the five? The four of us? The five that can Same. vote are the, are the um, existing planning board members before election. So okay. you, Frank, Frank, Frank Fran, Muriel, and Amy, okay. just you. for the public. Yeah, I, I knew you knew at that point. Um, are we prepared for the solar continuation? Yes. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion to reopen the continued public hearing for the Wilson and the Street Cedar Street Solar Photovoltaic Special Permit. So moved. Is there a second? Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry to keep you waiting. My name is Christopher King with Atlantic Design Engineers. Um, I have a couple of handouts that might facilitate our discussion <coughs> this evening. If you bear with me, I have a stack of uh, plans as uh, well as letters that were previously sent uh, this morning to Georgia and as well as a little map blow up of the Upper Charles River Trail master plan as well. Just for the public's information, these were revised today, July 9th. If there are extra copies, can you give some of them to the um, sure. folks, the uh, butters uh, and neighbors? A couple extra copies, if anyone's interested. Um, I'd like to reserve one, if you don't mind, on the table. just want to say for the record, Chris, um, we have a pretty hard and fast deadline before our meetings. Okay. So you know that we are going to necessarily have to continue this past tonight anyway, because we have to, we would have had to have these plans before today in order to act on them tonight. But we can hear what you have to say, certainly. Okay. Uh, the intent this evening is to understand the plans are revised today, and I'm just getting you the letter today. Yep. Go over mainly the beta comments. Um, I've been in contact with Phil Paradise from beta who's here this evening. Um, so I know he has not had a chance to revise the plans, um, but the letter indicates all of the changes that we've incorporated and discussed and hopefully agreed previous with exception to a couple of the uh, comments which ultimately um, defer to the board's recommendation as far as uh, a, a favorable finding for the buffer alternative screening uh, provided. Uh, so I'd just like to open up and just, um, again, my name is Christopher King with Atlantic Design Engineers. I'm here on behalf of TGA Solar, the Wilson Street Solar Project. Uh, we were last before you in the beginning of June, roughly a month ago. Um, at which point in time we received a set of beta comments. We had revised the plans um, and then revised the plans after the first beta comment letter was received. So in turn, we have a second beta comment letter, if you will. Um, the letter was sent, again, I understand it was just this morning, um, but it was sent to uh, the planning department. And um, some of the key items that were outstanding uh, that are picked up on this site plan um, has been the site distances. Um, I haven't added additional information to the site plan, but in the response letter, 
Um, Wilson Street being a scenic road and understanding we're trying to utilize the existing cart path cut that currently does not require any stone wall removal or any you know, vegetation removal per the, the tree ordinance. Um, our sight lines as they're calculated are 60 feet to the left if you were pulling out of the Wilson Street driveway of our site. So looking to the north along Wilson Street, the way ASHTO um, requires you to model this is you have a vehicle, you have an eye height, and that vehicle is required to be set back a certain distance from the edge of the travel path. <clears throat> Typically, the sight distance are dictated by the posted speed limit on the road. Uh, Wilson Street not having a posted speed limit there's some level of interpretation there, and ultimately our goal is to make it so it's a safe condition for vehicles, bicycles, and pedestrians alike. Um, currently, if you were to uh, basically sit in a vehicle and pull as you're exiting the Wilson Street driveway, the sight line to the north is impeded primarily due to the existing trees and vegetation, which we're doing our best not to disturb. Um, and so, you know, our, we would offer up as evidence that it is a safe situation that we have a note on the site plans basically during construction we'll have a police detail to ensure vehicular and pedestrian safety and that would certainly we'd be amenable to including that as a condition on top of having it on the site plans. After construction ceases, uh, which is only maybe a three to four month period, the traffic in and out of there is extremely infrequent. Um, we're talking maybe one to two vehicle trips a month for maintenance purposes. A lot less infrequent than a single family residential use. And um, if you were to sit in that driveway and exit, and you know, yes, from the Astro distance from the edge of the roadway, you cannot see past those trees, but any motorist who has any experience under their belt is gonna creep up so the vehicle is not in the travel path to maximize their sight distances. And that's um, the case out at Wilson Street on that northerly line. As soon as you get past that Astro setback distance, you're able to see northerly. And I, I would be say, I would, it's safe to say that it's comparable to, you know, due to the geometry of Wilson Street, not only the topography, but also some of the blind curves. Um, the sight lines that are being provided without having to remove any of the existing trees is comparable to um, some of the single family houses in that area, particularly on some of those blind curves. So that coupled with the very infrequent vehicle trips after construction, after the police detail is not required to be there, I think it's, it's a reasonable estimate to say that the sight lines um, will not um, <coughs> produce an unsafe situation for vehicular egress out of the site. Yes. If I may, just a quick question, Chris. What type of vehicles would be making those one to two trips around? Are we talking just pickup trucks? Yeah, it's a pickup truck, maybe a pickup truck with a utility body. Um, you know, something that, uh, you know, it might be a landscaper um, to haul in equipment to mow. Um, someone doing inspections would probably just have a pickup truck. Um, so it's just regular maintenance vehicles, no heavy vehicles. Thank you. Um, uh, another one of the outstanding issues was the screening provided and basically data said it's up to the board to determine if the alternative screening is adequate. Um, we beefed up the screening considerably. Um, I'd like to talk about it in, in three parts, if you will. We have... Can you just for the board's uh, and the public's sure. um, benefit, what, uh, what comments are we on for screening in particular? Uh, so I, I apologize, I'll back up. G5 was the sight line distance yeah. comment. Uh, the screening comment was Z3. I'm sorry, through the chair, mm -hmm. one other question. So there's two letters that are dated July 9th. So there was the one that we were emailed earlier, which is different from the one we're going through now, and both of those are dated July 9th. Those are response to, I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. So there's this one that you just gave us, and then there's this one. Yeah, that's different. I apologize. I am not with Royal Tech. Sorry, okay, wrong one. 
We, yeah, it was confused. We had Sorry. two projects. That's school. Yeah. That's yep. a oh, okay. We had two right. plans come in late. Sorry. For nine no. months. Appreciate that. Okay, so Z3 yes. is where you are right now. Yeah, Z3. And there wasn't an, an outstanding comment per se, but, you know, beta defers to the board on this issue. And mm -hmm. so I just wanted to point out that we um, spent an afternoon with some of the abutters on site listening to their concerns, viewing the proposed array from their properties, and I believe developed a pretty sound screening program, which would include specific to the abutters in Wilson Street, providing mature plantings to make sure immediate screening is provided right after construction ceases, which is three to four months down the road. Um, if that's pre-fall winter, then you know the applicant, I think, you know, has gone above and beyond in the sense he's agreed to have a landscape architect come back during the non-foliar seasons when you don't have the, the canopy from the deciduous trees, it's just the coniferous species left, and ascertain whether or not the initial screening was adequate during the fall and winter months, and then propose additional screening as required to make sure, you know, the visual impact is not there from the abutters, particularly Mr. Shambo and Mr. Cutter. Um, and that screening is shown on the plans. In addition to the screening for abutters, we've skirted Wilson Street. Um, what we're going to uh, try to do kind of a, a forest restoration for some of the lower and mid level canopies to really try to block the view from Wilson Street itself and try to preserve the integrity of Wilson Street being a scenic road. Uh, and if I may, yeah. Mr. Yes. The Chair, uh, I don't know if Mr. Cutter's here today, Mr. Shambo, did the abutters agree to that? You know, or did they find that alternative option or suggestion amenable? So is Tom Shambo, 15 Wilson um, Street? I'm going to uh, actually ask you, only because people at home can't hear you, to come up to the microphone. We can, but they can't. Thank you. Tom Shambo, 15 Wilson Street. So we did meet for about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. There was some you know, good conversation some ideas and some what well, we could do and we might be able to and we'll look into those kind of comments but until i just saw the plans tonight i didn't know the details per se so i don't know that i can answer your question and say that it was satisfactory to me uh, Edward Cutter, uh, 21 oh he was there mm -hmm. sorry Hi. mr cutter i didn't see you behind there they weren't satisfactory to me because there's been no specificity of exactly what it is. There was a, a good chat, seemed to be a, a good reaction on the part of the developer, but there was a lot of talk and nothing was passed in concrete or in, in Europe. So <coughs> I would say we're not satisfied at this point. We have to see the detail I take. There's some new plans here tonight that I haven't seen before, and they always seem to come in in the last half hour. So uh, I can't say we're satisfied. I can't tell you how I am. Thank you. Okay, thank you. One more. <clears throat> Good evening, Madam Chair. Through you to the members, I'm Matt Zedek at 16 Wilson Street. I live across the street from the proposed project. I was not at the meeting, but it sounds like it was a good initial uh, conversation. I didn't think it was appropriate at that time to give input because it was so many questions about how, what the nature of the project was going to be, questions about the uh, infrastructure on the Wilson Street side, where the panels exactly were going to be, because I think there were still some in the plans at that point that were within the 100 foot buffer. So there were still a lot of outstanding questions on how it was going to end up being, and I'm looking forward to offering comments on what the pr appropriate screening will be once those type of details get worked out. Thank you. One more question through the chair. So I'm looking at the drawings here, maybe I'm just missing it. You said there's, there is some specificity, and I see where it's outlined where there's additional screening. But do you have any details about what that additional screening consists of? We have some details on the detail sheet, which do uh, basically a general character planting detail, um, with also a typical evergreen uh, planting. <coughs> Currently, a majority of those plantings are located within conservation's jurisdictional area. Uh, so our wetland professional is coming up with a species list and a more detailed planting plan that caters to really the commission's need in that sense. The idea from a screening standpoint, again, is we were all out on the site walk and we all saw the same vantage points. And you know, during the summer months, it's pretty thick in there. When you walk back however many feet it is to the array, 
you have a pretty hard time seeing the individual that's standing back in the woods. And, you know, we've agreed to beef that whole entire edge up with mature plantings in the immediate sight lines from the abutters. Um, and then go back when the leaves have fallen, the winter and fall, when you really see the holes and you can see from Mr. Chambeau clear through to Mr. Cutter's property. Identify the holes that need to be filled in. Hire a landscape architect, understanding that these are going to be plantings within close proximity to a residential dwelling, and really select something that's in good character with, you know, not only the reforest, uh, or the beefing up the forest and the plantings in the buffer zone, but also something that's going to be aesthetically pleasing to a homeowner. Um, so again, I understand the details aren't. I mean, it's tough to provide details in a situation like that because until you start clearing and understand where the holes are, you really can't effectively model sight lines through a full-grown forest. Um, and so, you know, again, it's if, if it was conditioned upon providing mature plantings to provide immediate, immediate screening and then reevaluating it, during the fall and winter and providing additional screening to, to eliminate the visual impact, um, then we would be amenable to that as well. And as I said, we still have to meet before the Conservation Commission next week, at which point in time we'll have a little bit more finite details as far as the planting plan goes, which we could certainly provide to the planning board you know, at that time. Um, but it's basically the screening areas are going to be as they're shown on the plan. The species and whatnot aren't shown on there. The height isn't shown on there because, quite frankly, you don't know until you get out there and you start identifying the areas that need the screening and identify what's appropriate to fill in that hole. Um, so the applicant has made a number of good faith efforts and he will continue to do this as well to make sure that <coughs> You know, at the end of the day, we want to make this, as, as Tim Votor has said numerous times, you want to be able to drive by Wilson Street and really not even bat an eye and realize that the project is there. And that's on page four, right? Just the details that you identified here. Uh, page seven, the last seven. sheet. Yeah. I believe on the top left, there's a little planting, a character plant. Okay, sure. details it right. Now, obviously, the mulch would not be there, but as far as spacing, and whatnot, that's gonna be pretty consistent with exception to the mature plantings which are gonna to require to provide the immediate screening. And that will be more consistent with the evergreen detail. Not to say every plant will be an evergreen, but that detail will be the same where it's a mature tree, if you will, as opposed to a shrub, a low laying mid-level shrub. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, I guess what, I, what I, my, my big concern is that these houses on Wilson are at quite a different elevation and this is at a lower elevation. Um, are you going to also look at, at, at those sight lines too from, from the residences? I, because it's going to be a challenge. Um, uh, we were actually out on site across the street from our project. I don't remember the woman's name. Maybe Tom or Ed can help me out. Susan. 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 She's, she's the one that I'm worried about. Yeah. yeah. We went up to Susan's and looked across, and there's some thick vegetation there. And so, you know, I'll put it to you this way. If there is a concern from that neighbor, anything would have to be done on, on Ms. Hanowitz's property. And again, the applicant is amenable to that. Right. But right. when we first went out there and looked okay. back at the array, the, the 75 feet we're leaving along Wilson Street, coupled with the forest that is in front of her house, because she kind of has a long driveway going up the hill, provides plenty of screening. Um, that was our thought, at least at the time, and I believe yeah, that in, was in the summer, but in the in the winter, it's quite quite a different scene. And again, we could that would be my concern. Again, if the applicant would certainly be amenable to including Ms. Hanowitz's property or anyone else who wanted to ascertain during the winter if they have a hole and then provide additional screening to limit Terrific. that visual Terrific. impact. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if I may, one, one additional thought through the chair. and I, This was done for some of the abutters with the Marathon School, and I know that they established a, a budget um, for additional screening. 
um, and then they worked with the, the homeowners to establish kind of effectively how they wanted to spend that, that money for part of that screening. Um, I'm curious, I don't know if that's, if that's a, a standard approach. It's something that I think for the abutters worked reasonably well because it allowed, it gave them some choice and I think it also provided some level of commitment from the developer as to, in this case, the town, but how much would support they were or how much, you know, um, uh, they were willing to commit to it. Sure. I don't know if, if, if other people have thoughts on that or if that's something that you would be open to, but that might be a way to, to better define um, you know, exactly what you're going to commit um, to additional screening. Are you, uh, excuse me, are you referring to, um, let's say, the fall and winter seasons, if you will, kind of the reevaluation? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I could certainly, I mean, I, I can't speak for my client, but I would think based on previous conversations on this aspect that I, I'm pretty sure he would be amenable to that. Okay. Um, I can certainly bring it to his attention. And it's basically just kind of creating a flexible fund, if you will. Yes. That if the homeowner is basically under their direction, has some input as to what's planted, where it's planted, and how it's ultimately going to look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Understandable. Um, so back to the beta comments. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Uh, SW8, um, which was just kind of an engineering thing where we were asked to provide uh, interim contours that were five feet apart to ensure the berms at the stormwater basins had a five foot wide berm to facilitate maintenance. Uh, we've done that. Um, we slightly revised the plans and I've Again, it was today, but we provided the information basically showing that the ponds were, are what they previously were designed. It's the same volume, essentially, and the stormwater program that we proposed uh, from the stormwater policy standpoint still meets all of the applicable standards, particularly peak rate of runoff and volume is what you kind of get into when you start re-augmenting basins. So, we ran the numbers through the model again to double check to make sure that we were still okay in that respect. And we are, and that documentation has been provided to beta. Um, we were able to, in that process also, uh, in working with beta, eliminate two of the ponds, basically pulling the limit of work a little bit further away from the wetland. I know it's a conservation issue, but I think it's worth noting. And in lieu of those basins, we provided uh, three foot wide by one foot deep infiltration trenches basically to handle any of the runoff generated from the gravel areas or the equipment pad. Uh, another uh, little detail comment again is um, the, um, the beta re recommended um, doing something at the outlet structures within each basin to prevent clogging of the four inch pipe. Uh, so we put a detail on the detail sheet that shows a 4-inch pipe with a 4 by 12 increaser going to a 12-inch flared section, and we've called out the requirement for trash racks at all flared in sections, which is pretty typical for this application. And that would prevent the 4-inch pipe from being clogged and be able to be maintained during regular maintenance activities. Um, another groundwater related or stormwater related thing is uh, during conservation was brought to our attention that there was a previous delineation in which the uh, wetland professional noted that it was non-jurisdictional, but there was an area of groundwater discharge to the north side of the Shambo property. Um, it's in proximity of our driveway. And so what we've done to ensure the integrity of the driveway and also the adjacent Shambo property we're going to be um, installing a series of French drains basically to pick up that groundwater discharge, re-divert it, and into this stormwater management system. Um, and all of that area was previously included in the catchment area. So from a capacity standpoint, you know, it's more of making sure we're not creating a puddle at the bottom of the hill that's going to create a pooling area and negatively impact not only the Shambos property, but the integrity of the gravel access road as well. Can you chair? Yeah. Question for you, Chris, on yes. that four inch pipe. Yes, sir. We've done there, I think that's SW9. Yeah. Um, who occasionally checks and monitors that to ensure that it doesn't get clogged or if it does get clogged, that it's periodically just maintained and cleaned out? 
Sure. During construction, it's the site contractor's responsibility, and that's outlined in the SWIP. Um, and then once the operation, once the the facility is turnkeyed, and the owner, the owner then takes over, and there's a long-term operation and maintenance plan, and also notes in the detail sheet that specifies the frequency of inspections and maintenance for each of the BMPs we call them best management practices. Okay. And so the flared end sections would be included on that. When they go to inspect the basins, it's on a certain frequency or after a certain rain event, large rain event, they're required to go inspect them and do any clearing and uh, removing of debris as required. And then who monitors that group that's doing that work? Is that, does anybody monitor it? Or is there something maybe the only enforcement officer does that, or do we bake that into the condition? No, I don't know the answer to that question. Right. I'm just thinking, you know, a year, two years, three years down the road, where from a development standpoint, everybody's gone. Mm -hmm. But you know, implications of if it does get clogged out, that it could have a downstream impact to butters or wetland areas or whatnot. Sure, I've, I've seen it in the past where some municipalities or require a weekly inspection form, a sample to be included in the long-term operation and maintenance plan. And then it's the owner's responsibility to submit that to the applicable entities within the town, whether they have a stormwater permitting authority, a town engineer, a DPW. Right. Um, but something like that could, cer could certainly be written into the conditions that the long-term operation and maintenance shall include a filing of weekly inspection reports with whichever entity the town right. feels is appropriate. Correct. Yeah. Can, can you... Can, um, to the chair. Yeah. Um, can you show me where I, I see where the SW is in the center of the road? Can you show me where it is on the detail section? I'm sorry, the what? The the, um, the French drain that you were talking about that's going along the side of the road. Is that referred to the SW line? And can you show me where the detail for that is? Sure. The detail is. It's on seven seven, but seven seven. seven. Bottom, yeah. I guess it says detention basin section. And it's going to be the stone trench at the access road. Stone berm level spreader detail? Uh, this one here. Oh, stone trench detail access road. So, just question of. Um, detail what is the size of that I can't read it sure I apologize it's a little small it's 36 inches wide by oh. one foot deep and it runs down the middle of the road no no that would run along the side of the road and basically divert the groundwater the discharge of groundwater um, in the area that was identified so it's so it's lower I'm just trying to understand it so it's lower I'm just trying to figure out how this is all going to flow so so it's lower and the road is up higher and so there's a pitch on the road and it, and it feeds into both of them there's two of them on either side or is it just one on the um there's going to be uh probably just one trench. i believe there's just one trench at the base of the hill before the access drive and that's going to run alongside of the roadway along that area of groundwater discharge and then redirect it can you show on the big plan where that is, where that detail takes place? Maybe on 4-7. of Shambo's property, and I yes. don't see any indication um, of where that detail takes place. Uh, there are four pine trees here. Yep. There are four Five. trees shown. Yep. To the road side of that, there's a line that runs through in this area. Okay. The one, it's got several circles around it? Yes. Okay. And I apologize, someone did not change the line type for me, but that is the area where the groundwater discharges, and that's the area where the drain will be basically redirecting that and making sure that it doesn't pond in that area. Just a, a point of question. So the road is up higher, and the drain is down lower only in that one spot or all along that side of the road? 
just in this one spot, there was only one spot identified as an area of the groundwater discharge. And okay. it's really isolated. When you walk through this area, you can almost see the area that's indonated and historically been wet okay. and flooded out. And so with the road coming through, we didn't want to you know, dead end that and create a pool in this area. So we're basically going to put a trench in, send all that water down and into the site infrastructure. So the sheeting essentially is going to be going back into the solar arrays, the way it's drawn for a majority of the plan. Correct. The, the surface runoff generated, the sheet flow, the surface, sheet everything flows, hitting, going back into, it goes back into the array. This and is, the back into the array is gravel, essentially, underneath it. Gravel or crushed stone? The road what's road? underneath? What's underneath the arrays? <clears throat> the uh, underneath the arrays is going to be all grass. Grass. Okay. So yeah. well, it's absorbed the material. Yes. Okay, yes. So yes. great. Okay. Yeah. Everything other than the road is going to be kind of a low maintenance um, uh, slope mix, for lack of a better term. You see, kind of on the side of the highway that's mowed very infrequently, doesn't need a lot of water. Okay. Um, and that's going to be what is going to be in the array area proper. Thank you. You're welcome. Question about the process. So sure. We're going to go through the Davis comments and then we're going to go through the outline. So we yes. can address. Yeah. Okay. We don't, I had a question about utilities. And I okay. Wait till then. Yeah. We're definitely. So, so we're going to hold to a hard fast Tuesday before the meeting, the next time. For everything to be final so that everybody can review it yes, um, or we can't decide it because the public doesn't have a chance to impact it the engineers don't have a chance to impact it and we're going to run through the agenda proper um, and a lot of the discussion may may well have taken place but we will run through the agenda proper properly at the time that we have final plans and final comments is that does that work for you yeah okay. just to make sure everybody's clear on on process we have to um, we're happy to have a, you know these discussions with you we have this time tonight um, <coughs> but we do need to have a predictable process for the public and for ourselves okay John, to the chair yeah so in these drawings typically when you're doing a drawing you have a, a bubble and the bubble is around a certain area and it leads you to the drawing and I think part of the problem that I'm having flipping through this is that I don't see which detail is for which area. And it would be really helpful if we had some, it bubbled out in some format, whether it's a detail bubble saying C77 or, you know, what detail is where. Um, because it's just sort of just all runs together if you don't have a specific location. Is that possible to do? Um. I can look into clarifying the applicable, you know, where the details are. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. Just a question on that. Okay. Yeah. So you're talking about four or five pages, four, five, and six being the detail for the page three. So it's broken out into the different sections. Four, five, and six. Seven. Page seven. Page seven with yeah. all the details. Seven, oh, page seven. Okay. Seven, Thank you. Yeah, seven is all the details. Okay. But okay. It's hard to. I thought you could understand them back on the where, pages. Yeah. where those it. details are taken. So, Got it. sure, maybe I don't leader out every entity, but some of the representative ones. So, if you see a stone check dam on sheet four, five, and six, and one right. of them's keyed out to detail six on sheet seven, you'll know which, maybe not necessarily every one, but at least a couple, so you're able to navigate through the sheets a little easier. Yeah, right. that would be great. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, just for the sake of time, some a lot some of Beta's comments were basically recommending that it be a condition that it be a condition of approval, mm -hmm. and the applicant is amenable mm -hmm. to all of those in Beta's comment letter. Um, there was also a couple little engineering things, you know, adding check dams, making sure their slope are placed for the swale slope, which we've done. Um, uh, the swip. I know there was some previous talks about requiring the SWIP at this time. Which um, number are we on? Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm jumping ahead to SW15. Okay. Um, it says that you're amenable to this condition? Yes, prior to the building permit. And that's really to allow 
I mean, we'll, the engineers will typically prepare the SWIP, but more often times than not, it's once a site contractor and a site that's challenging like this, sequencing and phasing is going to be everything, and not having the opportunity to have the input from the contractor puts us a little bit handcuffed and kind of just throwing darts. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would offer that, you know, all of the detailed information to make sure that the temporary barriers are sized correctly, to make sure that erosion controls are going to prevent sediment and just a mess throughout. Um, all of that will be included in the SWIP and, you know, per, you know, all the I's dotted and T's crossed because that's going to be going before EPA for the construction um, general permit for the, for the SWIP process. Um, I'm going to jump to SW19 through 22, which have to do with the operation and maintenance plan, the long-term operation and maintenance plan that was included as part of the stormwater report, which speaks to who's going to be kind of maintaining each of the BMPs. Um, we've, um, the, the revised long-term operation and maintenance plan will include the owner's signature, so there will be some, some binding teeth to that. Um, we'll, we'll provide a BMP plan showing the location of the BMPs and the route to each uh, just to facilitate the maintenance operations. Um, we will include an estimated operations budget just so everyone has an idea of the order of magnitude of what it's going to take long term to inspect and maintain it from a stormwater standpoint. And then lastly, a list of discharge statement. Um, is included in the long-term operation maintenance plan and with the owner's signature we feel that complies with the standard as far as the statement required. Um, and then I think one of the last notes that Beta had was in regards to the gravel surface. It was initially, I believe, brought up by possibly Lucas or it may have been Beta um, to um, specify a washed or or gravel with minimum fines be proposed in areas that are immediately adjacent to the wetlands, particularly the Cedar Street gravel access. Um, they had asked that that be applied everywhere, and so we've gone ahead and added that to the detail on the detail sheet for the gravel access road, really basically saying that the material is required to be washed or contain minimal fines. So, so I think that wraps up the beta comments. Um, I don't know if you want to entertain opening it up to Mr. Paradis from Beta, yeah. or if you want to continue on the outline of the hearing. Well, one second. I just wanted to clarify. You go before the CONCOM when? Uh, the 17th. And the wetlands delineations changes have been finalized. They're finalized. The wetland delineation is finalized. We have some minor comments uh, specific to wild, wildlife evaluation, habitat evaluation that we've done. Our wetland scientist has performed a buffer zone capacity analysis, basically. Um, so you expect to be done with the CONCOM, hopefully, on the 17th? We're hoping so. We're hoping so. I mean, we've been before the various boards since <coughs> March, April, continued for one reason or another, and, you know, we're anxious to bring finality to the project. Okay. Dave, you had a question? Sir, I do have a question for Mr. Curtis. So, um... Our section G says that all um, utility connections will be underground. But did you? Yeah, it looks like there's overhead lines, utility lines in this application. So um, yeah, G. We just want to state that there's there's some above ground that's typical in these kind of projects. Um, but the majority of the utilities are below ground. Do we know if our previous two solar I projects? Is the I same situation as the Lumber Street? Yeah. They, they do have above, above ground? Yep. Okay. Just leaning into the site, is that right? Yep. Yep. And, and then through the chair, what about the connection between the Cedar Street component and the Wilson Street side? Are those? That's also overhead because we're spanning the wetland. That's so overhead as the well. Impacts. 200 foot spanning the weapon. Okay. Does that kind of defeat the purpose of steady power having overhead lines? I'm sorry, what was that? Does that kind of defeat the purpose of having steady power supply, having overhead lines and all the trees capable of flying over on those? Uh, well, the, the pull, uh, I mean, 
There's only two parts. The, the, the section running through the wet, the spanning the wetland is actually located within the large swath that the gas easement currently maintains. And so we're set back to the maximum extent, you know, they don't allow us to sink holes within the gas easement itself, but we're right up against it. And so the resulting distance is roughly in, in excess of 14 feet. At the minimum, it's 14. And so with that distance, the corridor is clear. And so, you know, barring a, an act of nature, it's, it's what we're forced to in that area. Um, just because direct drilling on a site like this due to the presence of ledge, the topography, and the proximity to the underground gas line, it's just not an option for us in that area. Okay, thanks. I was just um, asking the question because it's an easy decision for us for um, subdivisions for housing development mm -hmm. because it's all, you know, above the groundwater, mm -hmm. not a big deal, but I'm, just, I'm sure this is a, you know, these are special cases with the well, solar I think panels. Not for nothing, a lot of trees go away so that the same concern is not uh, in place, but, um, okay. D did you want to make any comments, Phil, at this point, or I know you've seen... We, uh, we, uh, are you good? I, I know you just saw it, so it's fine if you don't. You aren't prepared to do comments. Yeah, no, I I, I do appreciate your uh, the board's uh, emphasis now of, of getting the information ahead of time. Yeah. Um. Okay. And then I just had one more. I apologize. I forgot. I'd be remiss to mention that one of the beta comments was specific to making sure that we provide adequate access and turning throughout the site for emergency vehicles. Um, so again, some of the last minute, but I've coordinated with. Chief Slammon, who's here, um, he's given me the vehicle that he'd like us to show turning in and out of the site and getting in and out of the, each driveway, whether it be the Wilson Street or Cedar Street, um, and that information is added to the plans as well, showing the vehicle turning movements in and out um, for the different turnarounds, and on top of that, we've held our minimum roadway width to 12 feet with two-foot shoulders free of obstructions, um, and it's my understanding that is also adequate for emergency access and turning throughout the site as well. So, I'm sorry if I missed it because I was listening. Did have you um, have you ascertained that you have the turning radiuses, or you are coordinating with the chief to do? We that? have that the 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 turnarounds on site have been revised so that we're able to get basically a vehicle. It's an SU30 in and out of the different areas throughout the site for emergency purposes. And they're certainly oversized for the maintenance as well. But in the event they needed to get an ambulance on the far west side of the Wilson Street entrance, they could drive one down, and there's a turnaround provided so they wouldn't have to back straight out. <coughs> I see the chief is prepared to speak to it. Just in a similar nature to the conversation you've had so far, I have not seen the plan yet either. So I have given what I think would be a, a good first step was, which is an SU-30, which we kind of use as a general practice. It's not a code requirement for certain types of access here, so I've been evaluating each solar project on a case-by-case -case basis, trying to listen to the impacts and trying to make a suggestion that what would be a good, um, reasonable expectation for us to go in and help somebody or uh, work on some equipment if there was an emergency. So um, there's still some information I need kind of here where I could say we really have Mm -hmm. Done some due diligence that. and heard from some of the impacts of what I'm trying to uh, ask of you. Okay, thank you. Turn to the chair. Yes. Just one follow up yeah, on the see. overhead wiring. Chris, the, yes. um, I see that the, the road coming off of Wilson Street, there's overhead wiring going down the whole road, which makes sense because that connects the two first grids up there. But the bottom grid, I don't see how the power connects. Is there overhead coming down that driveway as well? From the lower array, well, southwest. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's tough to see, but there's an underground run that goes up across the gas easement. Okay. It goes, it goes actually. I'm sorry. It goes underground up and crosses a series of overhead lines across the gas easement and then across the wetland. You're probably better off looking at sheet six. Yeah, can you just point? Oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So the run is underground, coming up through here. Okay. To a pole. Uh, pulled across the easement just because we can't do underground yep, sure. across the easement and then we chose this side of the easement because that's where the clearing favors outside of the easement if you will and then overhead 
across the wetland to the other grid to a pole and then running okay. underground and connecting to the other underground okay. so basically it all comes in from C uh, Wilson Street correct that is correct thank you yeah and through the chair can, can you remind me again what, what's the benefit of connecting on the Wilson Street side as opposed to Cedar Street sure um, I'll do the best I can answer that as possible Typically, a solar project like this will go for a development impact study to whichever utility runs the infrastructure in the area. In this case, it's um, the east. Um, uh, back when the project was conceptualized, probably late last year, TJA contacted uh, the utility, um, shown them the site, and they go through a development impact analysis. Now, I'm not sure the specific factors that dictated why Wilson Street was identified by the utility as a point of interconnection for this project, but I do know that they look at a plethora of different things, um, including um, proximity to wetlands, existing infrastructure, um, existing capacity. It uh, has a lot to do with other projects that are already in the pipeline which have basically a, a queue of capacity that's reserved for them when they come online. And so at the point in time when this project was um, first brought to the utility, again, I was not involved in that process, but they do some sort of due diligence that involves all of those things and probably more, and they identified Wilson Street as being the point of interconnection. So just for the layperson, it, it's, the, it's the utility that is driving this connection. Correct. As a preference. Correct. Okay. So I think that um, just for me, as I've been reviewing this, it's going to be important for me to know um, that for some reason we can't do it through Cedar Street. I'm com I am pretty compelled by uh, the existing conditions and the neighbor's feedback. So I'd like to know from the utility company uh, or from you through the utility company what it would take to do it from the Cedar Street side. I can, uh, I can certainly investigate that. I know in the past two weeks or so, uh, my client has reached out to NSTAR. Um, but again, I, I'm not involved directly in that process, um, but I can certainly well, we have that whole thread, the email, right? Did yes. you read through that? We do have that yeah, thread. I do have that thread. Um, and I just, I, I guess I, I'm understanding pretty completely that this is a preference from the utility company, but it's not necessarily a planning preference or a Hopkinton preference or even an applicant preference. Um, and I'd like to understand um, what it would take to go in from Cedar Street as it would be much more um, reasonable for a lot of people who live adjacent to this project. Is it the, I mean, it's I Definitely guess. the aesthetics. Okay. Um, yeah, it's definitely that. We and, have an and the travel in and out. I mean, it's going to go right by people's homes on Cedar Street. It's an industrial section, right, below people's homes, but. Sure, I can look into that. In addition to that, in the event that, you know, this particular project is, quote, unquote, stuck with Wilson Street, we have an opportunity to bring some of those poles and some of the metering and switch gear underground into kind of a green cabinet that you see, the larger green cabinet. Um, we would still need one overhead run to get across the street to our point of interconnection because the poles run on the other side of Wilson Street. Um, but from a, an aesthetic standpoint, I think that that would certainly take take some of the, the sting out of the of how it looks and we could certainly supplement that with screening in the event Cedar Street is not an option for one reason. So anything that you can do in that in, in that regard is probably going to help all of us feel better. Oh well, it's going to help me feel yeah. better about the yeah. So yes. two comments. One thing, correct me if I'm wrong, but through that whole email thread, I thought that there would be a significant delay in the project if, if the wires was going to be moved over to Cedar Street. So I, I understand, well, I understand that that's a possibility. I don't think that that's necessarily true. That, if, I'm not, if I'm not incorrect, that's a utility company saying, look, we already reserved uh, power for you here. If you don't want it, we're going to go right to the next person. But I don't know that it tells us that they can't do it the other way. And it, or what, there's no quantifying the delay. I, but I, there was, I there was the, 
the, the statement that there was other projects in the queue. There right? are so other projects in the queue longer. on that side. So, but it would take on longer. that side, not necessarily on this side, well, on what's, the Cedar what's, Street what's side, outside this Wilson side? Street, not necessarily Cedar Street. We don't know. We have no okay. information on what. Hey, what like I said, happened. maybe I misunderstood, but I thought they were right. I think. No, I, I could be wrong as well, Dave. Well, I, yeah, I no, think. I don't. Well, there's a huge, there's a huge need over place park. Right. Yeah, so, but the mayor's point, if they're going to move it, if, is there a delay like if we understand. move it over to Cedar Street? I'd Which like to understand question. the impact to your project and what the possibilities are. I understand that, you know, you are you are aiming in a certain direction and any anything other than that is chal more challenging, but I'd like to know what that that means for, you, for the project, for sure. Cedar Street. I can talk with um, the applicant and see if we can provide some additional detail. Okay. Um, I do know that their development impact study for this particular project, it took 11 months to get them to where they were when they first um, submitted the application package back in March to the board. Um, and again, not understanding, and I don't know if they'll be, um, ex you know, 100% forthcoming as far as exactly what's in the crew, what's in the queue, and the exact capacity. But I do know at the time of this development impact study. It could have been a, a number of different things. It could have been the proximity of the poles to the wetlands, because Cedar Street on either side is tight to the wetlands. It could have been the fact that there was already capacity in the queue and they just couldn't fit anymore on the Cedar Street side. And I'm not sure if that's the case now, but again, I can look more into it and provide additional information. And like I said, we certainly amenable to working to reduce the visual impacts improve the aesthetics if ultimately we are stuck with the Wilson Street interconnection. I appreciate whatever you can do in that regard. Sorry, just one yeah. more yeah, no, on, the, on the utilities, because I'm the utility guy. You know, yeah, I so. get it. That's your job. <laughs> yeah. So you had just mentioned it to be amenable to putting it at the, over near Wilson Street, putting the utilities on your ground, but then having to go over with a, a utility pole over the street. Um, so our ask, and I can confirm this with the DPW, is though that you cut up the road and go under the road without putting that additional pole and that's what we did in front of the DPW so I would think that John would be amenable to it John Westerly but so just if you could if you're going to do that you could just look at that option as I well. can I can certainly look into that and see if that last run is available to go underground um, as long as everyone is amenable to you know yeah. trenching through Wilson Street yeah. causing a slight disruption I don't think the work would take too too long to get that done okay. the conduit and the pole no. thank you did you have more that you wanted to pre present? Uh, you know, I, I know there are some other items on the outline, um, the Charles Upper Charles River Trail. Um, yeah. I passed you a handout. Um, Jane was kind enough. The one page of the phone? Yeah, it's just one page. Um, she sent me, you know, five different JPEGs showing kind of an overlay master plan of the Upper Charles River Trail plan, different alternatives of providing the continuity um, from the northeast down to the southwest, south central portion of town. Mm -hmm. um, Do you, this is, Chair, is it okay if we have her speak to it since she's here? Yes, but um, sure. he can finish. Okay. And I haven't followed up with final, you know, we're taking a look at everything, obviously, last minute. I haven't had a chance to follow up with her formally. Um, but after taking a look at the master plan, the main goal of the Upper Charles River Trail is to basically in this area span Wilson Street to Cedar Street. And on the alternative that you see on the printout, the bike path is actually shown right on the lot line between 17 Wilson and Mr. Cutter's property. Goes across <coughs> to the west and connects to Cedar Street. Um, as you saw out on site, the topography is challenging at best. The presence of ledge and the fact that the wetland system completely bisects the site, it makes it impossible to create a bike path in that area without significant direct wetland impacts. And so another thing I think it's important to note is that TJA at the end of the day is only going to be leasing this small area within a 34 acre tract of land. And so they don't control the areas outside of the lease area. Ultimately, the lease area is pretty much limited to the fence line and also includes any stormwater facilities that are located just adjacent to the fence. And so 
the bike path alternative as shown is outside of our lease area. So number one, we don't control that. And number two, just from a logistics standpoint, I don't think that this particular parcel is the, the right way to provide that connectivity between Wilson Street and Cedar Street. Okay, Jane, do you mind coming up and giving us your two cents? Thank you. Um, Jane Murray at 70 East Main Street, Chair of the Oak Charles Trail. And thank you first for communicating. And what Chris is uh, saying is valid, but what the Upper Charles Trail is looking for is uh, continuity and contiguity. This uh, site provides a plan B. Uh, the Board of Selectmen have requested that our committee provide various options for the Board of Selectmen to choose from. If um, one of our plans does not um, follow through, this would be another alternative where we could come down through the um, center trail, cross down through the uh, St. John Cemetery and back to recently purchased Fecto property that we bought. And it leads right to the Cedar Street where the, um, property, where the project is starting. And as Chris stated, um, the, his um, solar company does not own that property. So what we were asking, if it were possible for the property owner to uh, consider giving the town an easement of about 25 feet around um, the outside perimeter to get to where the solar property is and then um, consider um, uh, further a trail development through the solar property to Wilson Street. Now, it's true what you say about the wetlands, um, but if this were to come to pass and the town had legal egress, um, we would be looking for other funding to uh, build boardwalks or whatever was necessary. We would not be asking the property owner to do that at the end of the day. We would be seeking other funding to build boardwalks through the wetlands and to properly go through DEP and other state agencies to get the proper fund, um, permission to do that. So at this point, we were just requesting that the private property owner who is uh, leasing the property to the solar company to consider giving the town an easement for future development if that were to occur. Just to clarify, Jane, around yes. the whole property or along that edge? Um, no, uh, it would uh, enter Cedar Street and somehow, uh, if it were around the perimeter so that it wouldn't impede further development um, on the the developer for any uses that they may want to build there. If it were along the, in the, as the, we say, the no man's land zone in the, in the I believe the planning um, board does have permission. Uh, we, we have done that before with the school property on Marathon Farm. We requested and did get permission to build the trail along the uh, perimeter the 50-foot buffer zone. Mm -hmm. And so that would be something that we would be considering so that it wouldn't impact, negatively impact future development. And it would just be, a, you know, a legal easement at this point in time so that we could get to where this Ader property, the solar depart, uh, solar uh, farm is being built. And then with perhaps the um, cooperation of the developer, maybe have them help us build a multi-use trail so that at least at this point in time, the residents could benefit from at least a little bit of a trail in that area out to Wilson Street. And if that weren't something amenable at this point, uh, perhaps again, just legal easement around the, so that there's contiguation from Cedar Street all the way out to Wilson Street. Okay. And it's part of the planning the board's challenge to look at this to see if this is something that we perhaps as citizens would like to have you know if we can't build it now maybe if we do have this legal easement it is something that in the future could be further developed okay thank you jane so, appreciate it 
Yeah. Can I just ask one question for Jane? Because yes. um, I, as I look at the, the map, yes, um, the property perimeter has, if you're going to stay within that 25 foot uh, edge of the property, the topography is, is just not even feasible for a trail. And, and so I, I guess I'm just, that, that's my big concern is that it feels like, and it, 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 as I look at it, there, there may be some ways to route a trail through there, but there's certainly not within 25 feet of the property edge. I don't know if you've looked any more closely at the topography, particularly around the edges, but. No, I don't have access to the topography maps at this point in time. Okay. So, could, would, could you show us on the, uh, on the plan on 3-7, like where you were thinking the easement would go? Uh, perhaps Chris could. I can, I can give it a, give it a shot. Or at least turn to the sheet. <laughs> no promises. Um, can I just, uh, I just want to take a second to, to uh, we all know that this is happening, but in five minutes we're going to have to open and continue a hearing that was going to be at nine. So the public will have a chance to talk on this because we do have extra time okay. as it happens. Okay. So I just, in the interest of time, time in. Okay. Um, Jane, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it skirting the northern edge here at 17 and basically coming straight across to Cedar Street. So can you show it to us where we can see you do it on the map? Oh, sorry. It comes through here and then it angled down. It's tough to say exactly where it went, but yeah. basically across the pipeline along this straight line and then angled down. Um, but that would be right through your yeah, well, it'll be right through the array, and having a bike trail through an array, which is supposed to be a secure facility, is somewhat problematic just from a liability and, and risk standpoint. Um, but everything outside of it, I mean, the entire, I mean, the majority of the site is wetlands. And, and in, in addition to that, the gas easement is there, and the, the most narrow spot to span wetlands is within the gas easement. So if you're going to propose a bike path, Excuse me. And propose direct wetland impacts. Presumably, they'd want an alternatives analysis, and it's tough because you can't. It's been my experience on the three solar projects in close proximity to the gas easement that it takes an act of Congress to get something in the ground within the gas easement. And if you're going to be building a boardwalk to span the wetland, I just don't see that as being feasible for this site and particularly in this area. Um, again, without incurring significant wet, direct wetland impacts, whichever way the boardwalk is gonna go. And that's, you know, notwithstanding the severe topography, um, the ledge, and it's a challenging site. It's a challenging site for a bike path. I'm all for recreation. Um, but I just, I don't think that this is the site coupled with the fact that you know, we don't control the whole property at the end of the day. Um, and so, you know, getting us to provide an easement on a piece of property we know in the future we're not going to have any control of, I don't think is, is the best route to go. And then understanding the studies that are required to plan a bike path. What if that easement changes? Then we're talking about redrafting easement documents or re going through the easement and it, you know, by that point, this solar project is going to be built in three to four months. At that point, by the time the bike path comes to be to fruition and becomes more tangible, um, the project is you know going to be built, and we're just going to be lease operators within that large parcel. Um, so again, I would respectfully offer that I believe, for a litany of reasons, that this is not the site to provide the easement or the connectivity from Wilson Street to Cedar Street. Chair, I think you make yeah. the valid case. Um, I don't know what the opinions of the rest of the board are. So I, I, I see this from all sides, and I, to be honest with you, I think that um, this solar project may be built, utilized, and gone before the easement is utilized for the path. So the, the global argument is to try and maintain connectivity whenever it's possible to 
do that. Um, so, but I get it. I get it. I didn't realize it was going straight through the property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the challenge, right? Um, I'm going to at nine o'clock entertain a motion for we're going to we're just going to suspend discussion here for a couple of minutes. I don't think we have to close. Should um, we try to find that same problem? Yeah. Um, so let's let's open and continue global if you don't mind, and then okay. we can talk about that. Um, so we have um, we are we do for the public's um, benefit and for everybody's benefit. We have five members that can uh, vote on the global um, West Main Street project, and one of those members is missing tonight, so the applicant has been made aware and has requested a continuance to our meeting um, on the 23rd of July. We are going to, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna continue this to July 23rd at 7.35, which is, essentially at the same time as another hearing that has been uh, postponed many times. So we will take advantage of utilizing the time that's available to us. Um, if both go forward, then we will, uh, we will handle that at that time. But we anticipate having the time to address uh, the global proposal at 7.35 on July Sorry. 23rd. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, and we just have to extend the decision date to Thank July you. 30th. We also have to do that. So I will also entertain a motion to extend the decision date, and the applicant is amenable and knows this, okay, to July 30th, giving the um, staff time to generate the decision. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so um, we can um, come back and continue this conversation. Um, it was requested that we consider a five minute break. If everybody's okay with that, we'll take a five minute break. I know seven.
No. Oh, this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, so, I don't know what the thing is. Um, I'll yeah. have it. It's time to the retention. This is the gas oh. line. Suddenly it's an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> I, listen. I'm trying to support you. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> it actually. Okay, we're going to get started cool. again, 908. Yeah. Um, thank you all. Um, so, we are still talking about the Wilson Street, Cedar Street um, solar project. Um, I wanted to make sure I left time for any members of the public to throw in some comments right now. Yep. You have to just come up and introduce yourself, sir, your name and your address. Sure. Um, Chad Klasna, 10 Wilson Street. Um, so I've realized we actually are, are I'm coming up to speed on this. We are relatively new to the street, mm -hmm. um, although we purchased our home in January. We just took up residence, um, but I don't believe that we've actually ever been noticed. I think notice has been going to the prior owners. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'd, I'd ask the applicant if they maybe could update that. So I'm just um, reviewing some of these plans proposals for the first time. Um, one thing I wanted to, to bring up, the point that was raised about houses on the um, east side of the street that are a little more elevated, my house would be one of those especially, and based off of what I've seen in the plans. It looks like the easternmost array of panels might be in, directly in line with our view from the, the second floor. Um, and it sounds like the applicant has met with some of our neighbors to evaluate the sight lines and impacts from their property. And so that's certainly something that I would be interested in uh, as well, or wondering if that was considered with any of the proposed screen. Um, because uh, especially in the fall months, I, I think that easternmost panel might be shining directly up into our second floor. Thank you. Anybody else from the public? At this time? Yep. Tom Shambo, 15 Wilson Street. Um, been there since 1995. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I'm a solar owner myself. I'm in favor of solar energy. I have 35 panels on my roof, so. Um, just wanted to make sure that we do the right thing here for ourselves as well as for the town. I appreciate the fact that you brought up the lateness of plans and not really getting a chance to look at things and read the documents so that we can respond appropriately. Um, it's been a little frustrating being able to come prepared one way, but then, you know, things may have changed and you have to try to go through them and there's not enough copies and you're sitting there trying to, to do that. So I appreciate you bringing that up. I also appreciate you bringing up the electrical connection on Cedar Street. It is an industrial zoned site versus a agricultural or residential. My understanding, and I, you know, I'm not an expert at this, but I thought that all connections within the solar array needed to be underground. And you know, from the southern array to the northern array, it is being proposed inside of the 50 foot buffer zone, telephone poles and overhead connection. If we're gonna give on that and allow that to happen, it seems like we should try and get something for that. That's just my opinion. And the connection on Cedar Street might be a good way to, you know, to, to, you know, to offset that. On my property, I'm about 95% agricultural, maybe 98. And a small portion is residential A. The 75 <coughs> foot buffer is being encroached upon at this point in the agricultural area. And Evidently, I need to correspond to the 25 foot buffering on the back side of my property because of that small sliver that's in a different zoning area. In the town's bylaws, and again, what do I know, but 210.117.1, lots in two or more residences. If a lot is located in two or more residence districts, all the lots shall be considered by lying entirely within the district having the largest area and frontage requirements. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask that you consider that um, for the boundaries around my entire property as opposed to just that which has got an imaginary line through part of my property. Can you, can you show us on your property where your lines are? In general, I know you can't do it. This Here is the gray dashed line. Yep. It separates industrial agricultural A from residential. Okay. And so, these panels here and some of this work is within the 75 foot foot buffer on the total zoned agricultural. This is a my whole lot right here. Mm -hmm. And then the small sliver in the back is what falls into the residential. Mm -hmm. 
Um, when I had the solar panels put up on my roof, they came with apparatus. They connected with a satellite. I'm not sure if Star Wars was involved, but they knew uh, shadow lines. They knew what trees were going to be in the way. They knew exactly from 12 months prior what had happened with the sun, the angles, and so forth. I don't know if that's been done here or not and how that will affect you know, some of the screening, the buffering, the trees being cut, and so forth. But it seems like that's a piece that's missing that I wanted to, to, to bring up to you know, ask about. And then la lastly, I appreciate that we had the conversation. I appreciate that they're willing to do things, including the winter and the spring and so forth. But it does seem like we're missing a landscape plan. <laughs> and I'd really like to see that um, at some point before we say that we're going to go ahead and approve this. And then down the road, something you know will or might or could happen. My last comment, and I don't know if it falls within this ju uh, jurisdiction or uh, conservation commission, but I'm a little bit concerned about the snow removal. I know that you know there's not going to be a lot of people going through the property and so forth, but the, the road, the gravel road, and the panels and the fencing are fairly tight. If we get a foot and a half or two feet of snow and they need to go in and do maintenance, well, where does that go? And so I'm a, a, a bit concerned as a butter that that you know, should get addressed, and whether it's here or CONCOM, I don't know. So those are my comments, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. OK, thank you. Thank you. From the time when we show it, some people say we show it all the time, but if I'm not going to get any lots, I'm not going to try to joke. I smiled really once. Well, Thank you. It's good enough for me. Uh, the you, the I'm difference. Sorry. You do have to introduce yourself each time. Okay, and I'm not going to ask questions. <laughs> not that I don't know who you are, but the diff. My name is Edward Cutter. I live at 21 Wilson Street. I've been there since 2000. I have the two best neighbors possible. Uh, one is a cemetery on the right side, and the other one is Tom, and I, I'll take the living one. The difference to the people in this neighborhood, and it's a neighborhood that's grown closely together in recent years, the difference between the connection point being on Cedar Street and that connection point being on Wilson Street is just humongous. I mean, there's no possible comparison of it. The feeling that the people will have there and the way the place will look, it's as if you, if, if it's on Wilson Street, I'm trying to think what it would be like if, if you took a trash wagon and left it out there. That's the way we might perceive it with the connection. Lots of poles, lots of disruption. The Cedar Street location, by any kind of logic, makes a lot more sense by any kind of emotion to the people who are there. We're living there. We're not just trying to make some money by building something and then they're going to sell it off. The difference is just incredible there. Now, when we chatted for that, you would say all afternoon or whatever it was, and Tom will say an hour. I'll agree with both. Uh, Tom did ask, or I asked, I'm not quite sure, Tim Valore, I think his name is, how come you ended up on uh, Wilson versus Cedar Street? And the answer was, Eversource said that's what we'd have to do. About two days later, he very kindly, Ted Valore, Am I Tim? Yeah, Tim. That, Tim. Uh, sent a note to us and said he had sent a note to uh, Eversource to see if they might consider. And it seemed to me pretty implicit. He thought maybe they could do it or he would permit it. We have the thread that was mentioned. I think other people have this. And what's clear is that the person at Eversource did not say that you can't go on Cedar Street. Yes, there may be some hurdles. It may take you a little bit longer. Well, they've been at this for, I don't know, six, eight, ten months ago when they started looking at it. They didn't knock on anybody's door and say, where would you like it? What are your thoughts? What could we do to make this flow more smoothly? We would have reacted. We reacted. We're the ones who started some conversation. And we got a lot of nice things said. I'd like to see them written down so that we know that they're locked in. Uh, so. That possibility still seems open. I don't know what the town, this planning board can do. I, I don't know if there's anything you can do. I don't know if I can call anybody. I've thought about it, but I figure that's probably not my role, so I should be quiet. Uh, but that, it might cost a few more dollars. This is a funny piece of land. There's, I don't know how much is going to be spent to build this. Uh, 
friends who don't know much more than me have speculated it would be mid seven figure. Uh, and for that, suppose it did cost a little bit more. Well, we're talking about how some people live. And I think that ought to be weighed pretty heavily, and I would hope that you people would see it that way. Uh, delays have gone on for lots of reasons. People file papers late. Uh, three months pass between it being determined, maybe it's only two to be fair, that the wetland delineation that was provided to the Conservation Commission was wrong by a very, by 12% or something. It's such a large percentage, it's hard to, wouldn't like to think that it, that wasn't innocent, wouldn't like to think that. But uh, things could have moved more quickly. Uh, suppose they have to wait a little bit longer. Okay, I've been here, Tom's been here, these other people live here. We ought to have a shot at it. So we're asking you to reconsider or consider whether or not we should go through the Cedar Street exercise, find out. Who knows? They might say you can't come to Wilson Street. Cedar Street is an ideal place. That's where Mr. DePetrie got rezoning without objection from the abutters, and we had objected to certain other things he did. We didn't put it in place, but we didn't object to it. It's a perfect place for it to come in. There's no detriment to, to people living there. There's no upset. You don't destroy a neighborhood. We ask that you consider that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anybody else from the public? Um, okay. Um, so we. Chief, uh, Chief. Oh, Chief, thank you. I was looking down last time. Just as we're. Um, as I'm listening to the plan evolve and the access road, and it sounds like there'll be a permeable surface, and maybe that's something we could have. Um, normally, we try to have it's a little more difficult verifying the capacity to support our vehicles on a permeable surface. So, whether Beta or the um, designer could kind of just iron that issue out a little better, the maintenance, and um, just the, to demonstrate that it will um, support the vehicles we decide that it needs to support. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you yes. So one gentleman made a comment about the, the buffer areas and yes. the, um, the 75 feet. So correct me if I'm wrong, but those buffers would apply to if he was building something on his property. I think the buffers would apply to the other land, whether the they're agriculture. Well, it depends. So if you, if you own it, Georgia, do you want to? Jump yeah, in. I was just pulling my notes up. So, sorry, while I get this. If you have, so while well, she's looking them up, so I did have a question about the buffers and what. Yeah, and what's uh, my legit. understanding is, and I'm willing to be right or wrong about it too, is that that you have to use the most, the the largest buffers of whatever, however your property is zoned, if it's multiply zoned. Is that correct? No, so the, you have to use a certain buffer amount for that dedicated district. So like he said, agriculture 75. So where it is, where the agricultural district is there, they need to meet the buffer requirement on their property. And then where it's 25, they would have to meet that 25 requirement on their property. So if Tom were to build something on his property, it, the setbacks are for non-residential uses, which would be this in the agriculture and the So river. you can have multiple setbacks in multiple places. For this buffer on, zone. On a single piece of property. Yes. I, I, I would want to confirm that, but I would. I, I would appreciate the confirmation there, because I think that that is an area that we're going to have to um, provide relief if that's the case. And I see Chris is yeah. down there, and perhaps you know the answer to it. Well, I, I was just going to note, I agree. And again, I don't know the right or wrong answer to this, but typically it's been my experience where the application of the more conservative setback yeah. is typically applied to structures and built fence lines, anything that's prohibited within the building line setback. I'm not sure that holds true for the required buffer per the article in zoning, but we would certainly look at that. If we have an opportunity to provide 75 feet, we would do that or provide alternative screening. But based on my cursory review months back now, uh, it's my recollection, uh, recollection, again, I can confirm this, that that part of the zoning replies, applies to structures and not necessarily the required existing buffer to be maintained. 
quick follow up. Yeah. It looks like there's five or six trees on his property. Is that you would plant trees on his property? Yes, that okay. was yeah, that was part of our discussion two or three weeks ago. Is that a couple of the holes are on his property, and understanding that they're on the abutters property, that's when it was brought up to hire a landscape architect instead of just having someone throw plants on a plan. Hire a landscape architect to do something that's prudent and makes sense for you know, it's considering it's on a homeowner's property. It looks like that's on the high side, so it makes sense. And it yes. might be true on other people's properties across the road too. It will help with that as well. But again, you know, I can't speak for every lot across the street. Right. I apologize, Chad. We didn't visit your. I'm still. I'm going to look up which house is yours and get a better feel for what you can see across the street. But the. The height differential and the existing vegetation, understanding that some of it is, is deciduous, a lot of it is going to hold in the winter and it's going to provide screening and it's going to prevent the direct glare. Um, not to mention the solar panels are pointed due south anyways, so any kind of you know side glare coming off at you know a, an unforeseen angle is you know it's not feasible for an array like this. Um, but as far as the site down there, you know, we could certainly look at it. And if, you know, there was an instance where, you know, there was a, a, a glaring instance of uh, a visual impact, then we would certainly look at it. But we feel keeping the buffers in place, coming up with the alternative screening along Mr. Chambeau's property, which is against a buffer that doesn't meet the 75 feet due to the existing car path in the first place, we feel like it you know, meets the intent of the bylaw as long as we provide immediate screening and go back and ascertain whether or not it's adequate during the fall and winter months. Um, you know, there was mention to you know, the number of panels within the 100 foot or the 75 foot. That's strictly a conservation issue. Tree cutting within the property Again, that's something we're dealing with conservation on. Yes, they have gadgets you can go out and do an actual shading study, but typically a lot of these solar fields are built on lands that are already cleared. They don't have a lot of wide open tracks that are available for solar, and that's what has forced us to this. And so right now, we can do our best guess based on tree heights and, and setbacks and some of the helioscope programs we have, but until you get out there and do some tree clearing, you don't know exactly the shading impacts and there have been projects in the past where they've done their perimeter clearing and they've come out and done their shading analysis and it's been um, decided out in the field that one row of panels is too close to the southerly tree line and they just have foregone building those panels and precluding them from having to go to trim additional trees or pollard additional trees depending on the sensitivity and the location of those trees. So. Um, another thing too, since we brought it up, is that a lot of this, this site is, again, surrounded by wetlands. These wetlands, and for the most part, are in definitive sloped topographic areas. And so a majority of the line is the line. It's, you know, and there's not a lot of interpretation, but there are areas here where there's a shallow, um, um, very shallow sloped wetland and the difference in topography or the plant communities is subject to interpretation. And a lot of times there's no definitive line of a wetland. It's a transition zone. And it comes to the professionals hired by the applicant and the town to come to the understanding of where that line actually is. And that's basically what was done uh, during this project. Our professional went out, delineated the line, um, it was subject to interpretation. We went out, we revisited it, and agreed to align. So I'd like to try to put that issue to rest before the planning board this evening. Um, and then snow removal, you know, we can certainly look at that. Um, uh, there's plenty of area on site for snow removal, and if, it needs, if there isn't, again, we're surrounded by wetlands, so there aren't too many areas where we can store snow without impacting the panels. And so if we need to, it's going to be a snow disposal operation. Um, and then lastly, regarding the interconnection, um, to my knowledge, there's nothing that limits electrical connections to the industrial zone. Um, so, I mean, yes, in a perfect world, it would make sense to have an, an electrical connection in the industrial zone, but the fact of the matter is, the utility is the one deciding this. 
and I'll work on getting you additional information to back that up. Um, but at the end of the day, if it's an aesthetics thing, you know, an additional pull along Wilson Street with some, you know, underground cabinets that are screened with, with plantings is a far cry from a hay cart left in the middle of the road. Um, in addition, we're going to be creating a gate at the entrance, uh, much really to the abutters' request that we don't create an area once you drive down the driveway that um, whomever can partake in nefarious activities. There's no lighting on the site, and so it's a great spot to hide out. So we've decided to put uh, kind of a wooden, kind of old farm look gate at the entrance. Not as, um, and it's, you know, functions not only as our chain link security gate is set well off of Wilson Street. Um, you can't see that from the road, but the one that you can see from Wilson Street, which is, which is newly added, um, much to the request of the abutter to prevent people from going down there in an area that's unobserved, um, is going to you know dress up the area. Um, if you drive up Wilson Street now, um, you know on the left hand side there's a bunch of properties, quite frankly, that should probably be in the industrial zone, but they're not. And so I don't think an extra pole with some uh, utility cabinets are going to be. Uh, you know, uh, we are going to have to wrap up, Chris, because I'm watching time for um, for the yeah. next hearing. I just don't. I think that's a far cry from some of the the, the similar some of the things that were brought up. Especially if we're able to reduce the impact and get some of those poles underground with cabinets. You know, I think that it would be harmonious with the bylaw, and certainly, um, again, you know, if. It depends on what the utility says, but I think that that would be certainly, you know, within the bylaw as far as screening and providing, uh, pr preserving the scenic integrity of Wilson Street. So what mean? We, we yeah. actually don't have time. Well, just time. one quick special request made before the next meeting. Okay, hold, hold that thought. Do we have to still have to have a scenic uh, road um, permit if they don't disrupt? If they don't disrupt the wall or yeah, the trees. I want to double check, but I, I don't see a problem with the, they could get approval on that. He knows he has to file, which. I'm sorry, he does have to file a scenic road permit no matter what. Yeah, no matter what. I'm not sure if it has to come before uh, the approval of this, but I can confirm before the next meeting. Okay. Yeah. I just want to know maybe if Beta could take a look at before the next meeting, the buffers and if we're, if they're asking for a waiver there or not, or what they are supposed to be. For the next meeting, yeah, please. Um, so um, I'm going to entertain. So we have to take a vote on the decision, uh, extending the decision date to yes. And we'll, so if we move this hearing to the 27th of August, um, what would we vote need the decision to be? September. Okay. There's a holiday in there. Sorry. Yeah, so let me pull up the calendar. Yeah, definitely do that. Um, I would say extend it to Thursday the 6th. Okay, so um, September 6th. I'll enter to, and that's, that's amenable to you, the applicant, this is September 6th? Okay. Um, I'll entertain a motion to extend the decision to September 6th. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to entertain a motion to continue this public hearing to 745 on August 27th. Is that open still? It looked like it was open before. It's still open. Yeah, we have okay. master plan implementation date, but it doesn't have a date. Okay. Um, um, at least an hour, I would say. An hour. So 745 to 845. Um, that, however, is contingent upon all your materials being final. Two weeks prior. By, by, it's one, it's one week prior, actually, but okay. two weeks would be, you know, amazing. <laughs> should <be> <laughs> I should have gone for the two. <laughs> but um, if they're not in by the 21st, we're continuing. Fair enough. Okay. Understood. Um, so I'll entertain that motion. So moved. Second. Or second. 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. entertain a motion to open the public hearing for site plan review of major project 90 Hayden Road, the town of Hopkinton School Department. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Introduce yourself and your team. Uh, good evening, my name is Bill Murth from Well Tech Engineering. I'm here on behalf of the Hobby Creek School Department. And what I'd like to walk with you through tonight is the conversion of Field 9 into a practice soccer field to a bus parking lot. Well, just to talk a little bit about the evolution of the project, uh, we're working with the school department and school committee on optimizing the internal circulation within the school campus. Um, as you are aware, there's a, currently a student um, a bus drop-off area as well as a parent uh, and student drop-off area. And the queues within the school property itself extend onto Hayden Row, creating traffic congestion and safety issues on Hayden Row. Uh, concurrently, we're working with the Department of Public Works and uh, Mr. Wesseling on the reconstruction of Hayden Row, which should be beginning any, any day now, but honestly. Um, to improve safety along this corridor, as well as widen the driveway to the school campus to two lanes approaching Hayden Road. And the idea being is sh shifting the, the traffic queue that's on Hayden Road, getting that into the school campus. And one option that we looked at as coming up with several options is to <coughs> use the existing bus loop as a parent uh, student drop-off that allows two loops of drop-off um, allowing more queue. And obviously if we do that, we need to find some place for the buses. So we looked at options for buses throughout the campus. Uh, with the, the option that seemed to make the most sense in close proximity to the school was the use of Field 9, the practice soccer field, uh, particularly given the, the, um, the use of the, the new uh, synthetic fields. So we looked at if the size was correct, we need to provide spaces for approximately 30 or so buses. We will actually allow for 33, we do have some growth within the site. Uh, we also provide parking, uh, 35 parking spaces uh, for the bus drivers. So the way it would work is that the circulation for the, the parent uh, student drop-off would be in the front of the school using the two loops, and the bus would be exclusive to the east uh, access road and to the- I'm sorry, can field. I just, yep. you don't mean to start at the middle school when you did that, when you, sw you you're still Hayden Row accessing the two loops. No, it is an option. So explain that to me one more time, I'm sorry. The, the, it's still, it, the access into the campus is still the same as it is today. Yes. As, as of right now. Okay. But it allows you to use two, the two loops right. for, for students, as opposed okay. to not being able to use this and it's just extending throughout onto Hayden Row. So we're still looking at options internally, but okay. one option, while well, the first phase of a larger plan is to get the buses separated from the students and the parents. So that's kind of the evolution of, of Field 9 lot. Just to walk through the plans uh, briefly. Um, so as I said, it's the existing existing site for Field 9. Uh, the, the elevations are roughly gonna be the same. We're raising it a, a foot or so. The idea there is removing the topsoil, putting in a gravel base for the roadway. It's around 350 feet by 120 feet, approximately 1.6 acres of site. The site's already disturbed. It's basically the, the, the extent of the soccer field is where the parking lot's going. Uh, just showing here ero some erosion control, uh, protecting the wetlands and the existing detention basin. It's 
far as the site plan itself, um, very simple. Um, rectangular parking lot. We do have some channelization traffic islands, which will be landscapes. Uh, we're going to have a new walkway uh, for the students. And the way this is going to work, the buses are going to come into the access drive, drop off, and then go in, circulate, and park in the lot during the day. And then for afternoon dismissal, the students would walk along a new sidewalk. We have new ADA compliant ramps. There will be walkways to load the buses, and then the buses will pull out one by one. Uh, another uh, benefit to the town of having the buses back here is now there's a, pl a place in town for buses to be parked, which is, represents around $50,000 in excise tax. And also, having the buses in close proximity is a reduction in the school department's contract with the school um, bus company. So it's a savings of $100,000 to the town by relocating the buses to this parking lot. Annually. Annually, correct. Um, we do have, we're going to be going through Conservation Commission next week. Um, we do have some stormwater issues that we're addressing. We basically have sheet flow. We have a stone line swale going to an existing detention basin, which has been cleaned out over the past couple weeks, I believe. Um, we're modeling um, the stormwater to make sure there's no adverse impact downstream from the site itself. Uh, I mentioned the two landscape islands. This is meant to operate in a counterclockwise fashion. Again, just taking a look at the grading, again, everything is sheet flow to the back. Essentially, the existing um, travel pattern of the water right now is shedding to the back, and then we're going to be collecting it in the swale and discharging it into the detention basin. This is just the paper marking plan, again, just to show how it's a, it's a one way circulation, counterclockwise. We have these two walkways, again, the bus is going to be lined up, again, parking for 33 buses. Students will access the buses through these walkways into the buses, and then the buses pull out one by one. And then, just excuse me if I may, through the chair, mm -hmm. you mentioned also that there'll be um, parking for the bus drivers themselves. Correct. Is that along the perimeter? That's around the perimeter, that? correct. And it's only yep. going to be bus drivers that are going to be. That's that's the intent of the bus drivers, right? Thirty-three buses. We have thirty-five spaces. We uh, we did have a comment. Uh, we did add uh, two handicap spaces, mm -hmm. and it would be an accessible spot. Uh, since, the, since the original plan that was submitted. Any more questions on that? Okay, I almost hate, this is okay, Marilyn. Yeah. I almost hate to bring this up, but do you have any expansion potential, like if you needed to add another bus <laughs> route the following year, or is this exactly the number of buses we have now? I believe we have 20. Yeah, so we have 28 buses, and we're building a lot for 33. Okay, great. So can I just say, if, if you're going to speak, we, we appreciate that, but the public at home can't hear you if you're not at one of the microphones. So I'll just um, re-answer that question. So we currently have 28 buses for the middle school, high school, and we're building the lot to accommodate 33. Next plan is uh, lighting and we're proposing four lights on uh, each corner. Uh, originally, we had three. We added one uh, light fixture, so it was pretty much even throughout. The, the intent of the, the lighting is more for security reasons than anything else. We're not lighting up a, a, a large commercial parking lot. It's just for security and lighting, particularly at night. Um, so, and I know there was an issue with the height of the fixtures, which was raised. Um, the 25 foot, the reason that was uh, proposed was that's consistent with the rest of the campus lighting. Uh, I know it's a residential zone that's in, meant to be 15 feet, but given the, the site and trying to be consistent with the existing fixtures and light poles that are out there, that's what determined or set the 25 foot, foot height. Uh, there'll be dark sky, cutout fixtures. It's pretty well screened back there between the, the woods and the building itself, um, so I don't think we're going to see a, a, a glow of lighting there. Um, one comment yeah. that did you yeah, Hold on one second. Hold on chair. one second. Let's oh. just let him finish and then. Okay. Yeah, I'll definitely come to you. Uh, one comment that did come in that was added since the plans, we actually have the, the um, lighting details and standard foundations, which was one comment that we received from the peer review consultant. So, question on the lighting, and I'm going to beat Amy to this. So, this came to the design review board, yeah. and we had concerns about um, all night lighting. So, have you guys had a chance to look at the possibility of action, motivated, motion, motion detected lighting? Uh, we did not look at motion activated. I don't think the rest of the campus is. It doesn't matter. No. We're going to need to look at that okay. for sure. 
But it's it's a big beam of light out there, and there are residences all around. Um, so the the campus itself is on all night long, the whole campus, and in discussions with the chief of police, that is what his preference is for the school campuses. So, so we, have, we should probably yeah, we hear do. from the chief of yeah. police, but we're, we're, we can't just, you know, put a Rudolph's nose up there and just keep light, yeah. lighting it up and expecting right. everybody around to not have issues with that. We're very, very concerned about safety as well, but I think that there's got to be a way to do it and, and be in balance. And we just further comment, we don't want to take a bad situation and make it worse. So just because the rest of it's but that way doesn't mean we can't do it better this time around. I just want to make sure we look at it for sure. Yeah. Uh, Bill, maybe you can just describe um, the lighting itself and how that spray is going to come across. Yeah, the light is not, like I said, it's, it's, it's a dark it's cutoff picture. It's not meant to be, it's not a, it's not a beacon of light. The light is all directed directed down. And I, I mean, I think given the, given the, the perimeter and the building itself, the building itself is going to hide anything from the front. It's below the elevation of the building itself. And around there is is woods. And the other part of it, we're only having four lights. So the amount of lumens there, it's not like that's why I was careful. It's not a commercial parking lot like a large supermarket would be. Uh, you have four lights. It's basically just a deterrent for vandalism overnight parking. That that's the that's the. It's not meant to be lit up, so yeah. it's not going to be probably as bright as you. So I would be curious, I, pr I appreciate that, and I think I understood that that was why that was happening back there. Um, I would think that lights that pop on when somebody moves back there would achieve the same end. I just want to make sure we, we ask that question and we look into that. And it, did you say they were dark sky certified lighting? Is yeah. that, okay, great. Did you want to keep going? Or? Any, no, I don't have any questions. Oh, that was my last, last slide. Uh, last yeah. sheet. Not a lot to it. It's a parking lot. Yeah, yeah. it's a parking lot. <laughs> um, I have a, just a, a quick question about refueling. Uh, is there going to be a, where are the buses going to refuel? Is it all going to be within town now? Yes. So where will they where, where will they be refueling? Um, they do it a variety of different ways. They have also have a refueling truck that comes around and fuels the buses. Yeah, that, thank you. Um, so one of the other benefit of having the, the buses parking on site is there are less trips going through open neighborhoods, less vehicle emissions. Another benefit of just having the buses parking on, on site. Yeah, and also refueling locally too, not having to, to, to travel. Is it a concern on the site to refuel? I don't, I don't know anything about refueling in a truck. Um, to refuel on site, I mean, they they get uh, DTE, you know, Department of Transportation. Um, they have all their hazmat certifications that they have to do and follow in order to do that. So there is all the precautionary measures that they have to do to do that. And we we don't. I, I presume we don't have to look at that at all for refueling operations on site. Yeah. Um, I'll just double check, but I, there are provisions for that already in the stormwater standards and stuff. And considering stormwater is a big piece of this, it most likely would be a requirement that that's provided um, proof of that um, certification. certification or notice of when work's being started with refueling operations, because um, there are certain provisions for that, especially with the wetlands in the area. So I'll make that note. We can add that. Just to make sure. I, I, I hope that I, I, that makes a lot of sense because I think that's a huge savings as well for the school. Mm -hmm. um, I just was curious about that. Also worth checking whether we can refuel on asphalt. Mm -hmm. So can I ask a question, Gary? You're listed, actually, yeah. as an abutter. I was just looking at the list. So yeah. Yeah. Find oh. 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 I almost, I didn't think of it at the beginning, but... I always think it's. Well, I, I think you could safely participate, but I think it's better if you don't. Actually, it's your choice. Okay. I will. Abstain. I'll abstain. Okay. I just it, it jumped into my head sort of midway yes. through. The, the half of the town is on that. <laughs> <laughs> actually, everybody should sort of check. I know that I'm not, but it's a it's a big butter list. Okay, just the. It's pages and pages. I guess I won't ask my next question. 
Um, you can you can sit in the audience and you can ask your questions for sure. <laughs> that's that's kind of like. And I think that there's an argument to be made that this is a school project and it abuts everybody and that you know that we could safely participate, but it is strictly by the numbers more. Uh, one fifty. One forty nine. Actually, one forty seven to one forty nine. Yeah, it's, it's a long list. It's a long list. It's a long list. Three pages. Just double check them. Yeah, yeah, go three ahead. Three pages. Yeah. Um, I, I, I sort of have a feeling that this is a really tight for this many buses. Mm -hmm. Has it been? Have all the turning radiuses been vetted? Yeah. Yep. And um, is fire safety aware of the existing road and whether that's safe? For emergency vehicles and that kind of thing, um, especially like especially down um, on the road that's not changing the entrance to the school, the service drive for the school. I didn't evaluate the access road, so I can look at it, but I, I did not evaluate them. Yeah, I'm just I don't know. I just have a sense that there's it's an awful lot of traffic to put on a little plot of land. And it's an awful lot of backing up to get those buses in there. And I'm just a little concerned about that congestion, whether it's safe. So one, one of the comments from the period of myself was to run what we call auto turn, um, which is basically it runs the turn template uh, off the buses. Mm -hmm. um, we did that while we were designing, and we did it again, and we will provide that. Uh, we have copies of that as well. Um, that's why you see, you see this this radius here in this opening is much wider than the others. So the vehicles are coming in here, and the way this is designed is the vehicles are coming in, making a turn, and pulling in straight. So they're all turning and pulling in straight. So this is it's not designed for them to be making three and four and twenty point turns to get in. It's all counterclockwise. They're all pulling into a stall, and then they're all pulling out. And this the way they're going to come out, this angle and the width that's out here of pavement is ample enough to make those turns. What, may I, um, could you turn to the page yeah. six With that it's, has the markings on yeah, it? Yeah, it's concerning to me because the walkways are there and there's kids behind it um, on those walkways. I mean, how is that first bus going to make that turn? That's a 340 yeah. degree turn. It's a 40 foot yeah. um, uh, bus. So, so those yeah. are not raised walkways. Right, yeah, but they're these, these raised children. Just, just yeah, they're raised children. I'm just concerned <laughs> that you've got a 12-foot piece here. You've got a 40, is it a 45-degree 45 45 <coughs> angle? You've only got 12 feet to back up. And then There's, you have a nine-foot pedestrian walkway behind yeah, the bus. Where, where are you referring to backing up? Um, Any, it, well, anywhere. <laughs> the, but the no, first. The, there's no backing up. Because they pull forward. They're, they're all pulling forward. forward. They're all pulling oh, forward. Hello, guys. Okay. That's all. Okay. Yeah. That's, I was, but okay. how's that first one going to make that turn? If there's a bus in the second spot. So nobody's backing up. The, well, they're all they're all going to come in like they're they, they've got to we've got to work out with the bus company how they pull in. But they're all they're all going to pull in and then line up this way. And this turn come this the way this is set this last paper marking, this bus comes in here and makes this turn into here. But so it can't they can't be. I don't bus. think that's physically possible. I mean. <laughs> yeah, no turns. It, it, believe me, we we checked it. So the first spot is not really a spot, right? It's there's a gap that's it's not really a bus, right? Or do you know? So that first little island that's yeah, that's flush right. to the ground, not the walkway, that is a is part of the drive that's separating the school. This, this that, yeah, so that's separating the school, so people will be there. That, no, that's that's just a landscape island. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's. Okay. The, the students, the only the, the walk the path of the students are the, there's an existing walkway here mm -hmm. that we're picking up. They're coming down to here and then to this one walkway, and then continuing down to the second walkway. That's how they load the buses. They won't be walking. They won't be walking in, in here. Right, and they won't be loading until the buses are in and fixed, like they would any other time. Correct. Mm -hmm. And the, the buses, buses won't will leave be until the kids are in and fixed. Which is what we do now in right. the current bus. Right. Right. And all the all the um, bus driver vehicles are going to be are going to be parked until they get back from their route. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
Georgia, did you have any comments to start us off? Yeah, well, I did. I want to start with a correction on the memo. Oh, yes. Um, under where it says decision date, it says that the decision is due on the 16th. That is incorrect. The decision is due 90 days at the close of the hearing, so there's no set decision date. So the board wouldn't have to continue an action date. Anything else, Trisha? I didn't have anything else. Like um, Dave had mentioned, the design review board had met, um, and then the stormwater management. There's a lot of comments on that, so I yeah. say Phil could really cover a lot of those. Those were the biggest concern. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much, and don't go far, and we'll have Phil come next. <clears throat> Can I just ask a top level question? When are you hoping to do this project? <laughs> well, the idea was to get it done before the beginning of school right. session starts up again. Right. Okay. And how long is it going to take you to do it? Uh, we're estimated around a month. A month, month is probably aggressive. And, uh, probably six weeks is probably more realistic. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Phil. So, uh, for the record, uh, my name is Phil Paradis with Beta Group. We are um, working on behalf of the town to work on issues related to safety and stormwater and, and zoning issues uh, for this project. So as uh, uh, and I appreciate the presentation, uh, several of our comments were addressed uh, during the presentation. So I'm just going to focus on you know some of the things we did look at, making sure that uh, there's you know the question of access and uh, turning and, and such, uh, and, and provided that the auto turn plan is satisfactory, we, we would expect expect that to be addressed. Uh, ADA compliance as well, adding additional um, uh, handicapped spaces, as well as, from what I noticed, both, both ends did not appear to comply with a uh, minimum of 5% grade. So we would uh, ask the applicant to look at those to make sure that they, they would uh, uh, comply with ADA compliance. Relative to uh, stormwater, there's a number of stormwater uh, issues, and uh, a little concern with the question about refueling on site uh, because that would turn the um, the site into a land use of higher potential pollutant loads, which would require some additional BMPs relative to being able to capture any spills of, of fuel. Um, so we wouldn't want to revisit that if, that, if that's the case. Otherwise, um, some of the, a number of the, we just need a little bit more information uh, in some of these areas to be able to complete the review. Um, there is a lot of pavement area, and it will be uh, projecting down. If you look at the grading plan, So um, I, I presume, from what I understand, the, the grading plan, there, there are a sidewalk, there's a sidewalk on this side and curb, and then there's, I think there's a curb on this side as well. Um, so stormwater runoff is gonna wanna go toward the curb and, and, and concentrate in this area and also in this area. So we just wanna make sure that those areas are, are, are I wanna say, um, well protected against erosion and or um, uh, making sure that the, the, the soil can contain, contain the, the, the runoff there. Um, and so we did notice that there's some, it looks like it, there would be runoff uh, that would be uh, go against the curb here and probably run down the side, the edge of the pavement here. So we, would, we were recommending that they put a, a catch basin right there before it flipped and went into the parking lot, just to be able to capture mm -hmm. uh, some of that flow, reduce the flow, sheet flowing off across the parking lot. Um, relative to uh, the, again, we didn't have a, we didn't have enough data to be able to to 
review the model uh, because we didn't the some of the major pieces weren't weren't there. Um, but we we would presume that the um, the uh, lot of information would be provided. Um, so the, the the soils aren't very good, similar to the fields. Um, so we, you know, they're de they're derated soils, so they need to provide infiltration to the maximum extent practical, which uh, obviously a swale like that would provide some. And then they're expanding the detention basin, um, so that would provide some as well. Um, we think that the swale, we need a little more data on the swale itself to make sure that, um, and, and, and the detention basin. To, 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 to make sure that they are going to work together in, on a hydraulic condition. <coughs> um, we recommend a deep soil, deep, deep hole soil test be completed to figure, make sure that the, uh, the actual, the existing basin complies um, and with the separation of groundwater and um, get a feel for how much infiltration they will get. Um, again, the, the, the soils were rated D, which is very, very minimal infiltration. They did take, take some credit for infiltration, which I, I would um, recommend we look at that again. Uh, hold on one second, I just want to interrupt you. We are at 10 o'clock, but I recommend we press to get as much done as we can okay. so that we can with regards to the timeline that the school is looking at. Go ahead, yeah. Phil, I'm sorry, thank you. So, I mean, that's basically, and then we, uh, we looked at, uh, there's no, obviously no, no utilities needed for this other than lighting. Um, and some of, the, some of the issues relative to lighting were, were discussed already. Um, we, would, we, we did recommend they add a, a third light just to make it uniform because you get really bright areas. Adding light? Really Is that what you're telling me right now? You're adding <laughs> light. <laughs> well, if, if you have a dark area in a parking lot and a light area, you can't see, mm -hmm. you know, you can't see. Um, and that, obviously, the, the, the height of lights that's, that's subject to your mm -hmm. interpretation. Um, there is a landscaping component that was not addressed. Uh, and this may not be, you know, you're obviously not right up against uh, residences and stuff like that, but uh, we just ask that whether you feel like you need to, that needs to be. Uh, obeyed or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then wetlands, will, you know, obviously going to be reviewed before conservation. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you very much. And all those comments have already been sent forward to, to the school. Or is, are some of those on the fly from what we got today? No, 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 they're all. Yeah, they're thank all you. Okay, mind. perfect. Um, well, except for the, the refueling. The few refueling, yeah. Um, do any planning board members think we need to add to the outline? I just had a quick question on whether or not any of this work affects um, the new um, trails that have been done, the, the cross-country trails that have been done in that area? No, they do not. Okay. So I'm just, we can hear you. If somebody could just be <laughs> at one of the microphones so the public hears. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, any additions to the um, outline at all? Are there any members of the public here that wish to speak to this or add to the outline? Okay. Yeah, Gary Trendle, 31 Chamberlain Street, speaking as a resident and a butter, not as a member of the planning board. Um, I had a, a bunch of little questions that I'm hoping we can answer relatively quickly, but one, I, I thought it might be worth just reminding or I guess you asked this as a question, but um, this was voted on at town meeting. 
And just, I just wanted to, hoping someone could remind me, is this, was it voted to, to fund it in its entirety, or was it voted to do a study to produce a, 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 a plan for it? Um, the, the study to put together the design was already uh, paid for in this year's operating. Okay. So what was uh, voted at town meeting was actually to build this parking lot. Okay. Great, thank you. And just a little bit of background there. Yeah. Um, and then I'm, I'm curious if um, what impact, if at all, there is to the athletic programs, given that they're losing one of the closest fields to the schools? So this field is actually very rarely used. So from the athletic department, it does not have an impact. OK. Um, and then my um, two other questions. One, I'm curious, and then just seeing the tents on the, the overhead photo there, um, as I was thinking about it, so it feels like there's always going to be vehicles parked in this because it's either going to be the school buses or the, the cars or the school bus drivers. But um, knowing that in the past, sometimes the, the marathon tents can cause quite a bit of damage to our, our athletic fields, um, I was wondering if this might have any uh, secondary use for special events like the marathon that would potentially help preserve uh, the, the other fields on and so we did have, um, you know, after this past marathon, as you know, we had that horrendous weather, which caused a great deal of damage. Um, so we did have a post-marathon uh, meeting, and one of the discussion points was, what can we do better? And also the discussion, the fact that this field, which they do use as one of their staging areas for a tent, um, would become a parking lot. Now it's very different um, in terms of the types of tents that you would use on a parking lot versus a field. So the, um, the marathon committee is aware that that will be a change for next year. Um, so you know, in terms whether we still use it as a staging area and find a place for the buses to be for that amount of time, um, it also takes longer for those tents to be set up when they're on pavement versus a field, which could come into school days. So there are a lot of challenges with that, right. to continue that as a, as a staging area for the marathon. Okay, so the impact of that would then be that either that tent is moved elsewhere, Correct. Uh, or they operate with fewer tents. Yeah, it's, every, everything's on the table. Okay. And then one last question. I'm curious if there's any consideration for security cameras that might be an option as opposed to lighting if security is a primary concern. So one of the articles also that was passed at town meeting is uh, additional cameras, additional security cameras. So we'll be looking throughout the campus on you know what that funding, how many cameras we can get and where they would be. Um, so there probably would be an opportunity for cameras to be back there as well. But is it possible those could replace the lights? I don't know if they could replace lights because as you know in the winter time if you have athletic buses that are coming back in the dark, um, you know, because unfortunately in the winter time, 4.30 it's dark, you would have a bus potentially coming and parking and drivers. Even for the bus drivers actually in the morning when they, before they start the routes. It's that, that's true as well. So I mean that, okay. that's the difficulty. Um, you know, not only safety and you know vandalism, but you have to think of the safety of the drivers. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. You can stay. You can stay there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Martin Bays, 106 Hayden Road. We meet at the butter on the side of the road there. A couple of questions. Uh, the first one, looking at the, the way that the lot's laid out, certainly that would be the densest area of vehicles parked overnight on any of those properties in the, the school campus area. My question in the winter, how's plowing going to work? Well, I was trying to figure out how on earth you were going to get that area clean in the event of it. It's going to be pretty tough to, to move stuff out of there. The second point, maybe you might take it flippantly, but I, I think I speak for you a bit, but as you have permission not to standardize the height of the lighting, we would be quite happy if you could go not standard that would be 15 feet. If anybody goes around the campus checking whether all the poles are the same height, I think they need to look at other entrance. Okay, thank you. Um, and just so for plowing, the, the town does plow the parking lots, and so they would be doing the sweep around the buses, and snow is not stored on campus. 
um, the highway department takes them off currently throughout the campus. So it would be the same. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other uh, high level questions or questions? Just a quick um, how the buses will be loaded. Is it just first come, first serve, or certain bus numbers park in the same spot all the time? Typically, we try to line them up so that they're in the same, uh, so you don't have kids constantly trying to figure out where their buses are. Um, and again, that's the same what we do now currently. Thanks. Um, it's not a question necessarily for this project, but do you know the time frame of what's happening on the road in front of you? Is that happening at, at the same time this year? So that that's imminent. Yeah. Um, they, they, they should have started construction last week. Um, so I, I think that's going to be happening immediately, and the timeline for them to be done is also before the start of school. So it will be quite a challenge. And that would be just directly in front of campus. Yeah. Then they would move down to Chestnut Street. Yeah. So that whole Hayden Row is going to be a challenge. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. through, through the chair. Yeah. Uh, Phil, this may be directed toward you, but I'll send it out to the broader audience. With the uh, snow, I assume they're going to be salting that, that area as well? Um, they, yeah, same as they do. Exactly, right? Yeah, so that's right, it's, right. So they're going to be salting. You're going to have oil and fluids potentially from the, 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 the buses, which just occur as part of the natural being a bus. That, my understanding, will flow into the detention basin. I guess my question is, from the detention basin, where does that ultimately go? Because there's a couple streams that go on the back side that flow out to that whole watershed area. Um, has that been thought through and, and potentially the impact of that? So I'll to the answer. Yeah, so I mean the, the, the stone line swale that's there as well. I mean that was mentioned an oil like an oil water separator was another expression, I'm sure that's that's what you're thinking about. Uh, as of right now that's not proposed. Um, we have the, the stone swale. Um, looking to, to collect some of that, uh, but as of right now, we don't have an oil water separator proposed. I, I just think that's a broader question, especially as that flows from that detention basin, which I assume kind of infiltrates into the soil and back into the watershed. Right. Um, I, I don't think that's a minor thing, given the fact that you're now covering essentially field nine with, with tar and uh, asphalt in oh. addition to the to the bus, so I, I'm not sure if there's something to be considered in the, the broader analysis, but that's uh, something we should consider. And we expect that to come up with the Conservation Commission next week as well, so. Okay, and I, I see yeah. it, it's on here, Madam Chair, so I don't want to write a little bit more. Um, yeah, uh, Chief, do you have any comments while you're here? No, okay. Um, so uh, as a taxpayer who's uh, seen this you know, coming, I really appreciate that this is, is happening and I hope that we can sort of help facilitate it. Um, I think that we face a little bit of some scheduling challenges, so I'm going to see what we can do as far as um, mitigating for that and, and moving, keeping this moving. Um, I don't know if anybody has uh, the availability and the appetite to meet a half an hour early next meeting. 630. Uh, 7, seven. I'm sorry, seven. 7, yeah. Let's not go crazy. Get a little excited. <laughs> 7, that should be fine for me. 23rd. On the 23rd? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, Good. Um, anybody have any um, issues that they see are sort of uh, more substantial that we haven't discussed so that the school department knows what they are before they leave? I mean, I, I look at this and it tells me it doesn't work. I mean, not knowing any of the details, just doesn't pass the eye test. So what if like, what if this doesn't work? What if it's, what's plan B? <laughs> and, and like, and who did the, the report for all the turning and the order of the buses come in? It's so I, I presume that the engineers have done that and I understand that I can't make that work yeah. for myself. <laughs> but um, I, the, the, the math has been done. And the, the parking lot works. And the math was done for the Starbucks parking lot as well. Yeah, well, it's a fair point. You know, I, 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 see some, I see some problems, whether we have auto turn compliance, that I, I'd like to see a little presentation on how that all worked out. Because even with 
now I understand it, but even now that I understand it, that that little green strip in front of it, if it's a raised curved green strip, it's it's really tight in there. And it's it is, it's a huge load of buses on there. So I do have some concerns about what we're doing and 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 um, the environmental impact on on um, on our um, our lizard friends in in the back. Are they not lizards where <laughs> salamanders, <laughs> thank you. <I> should. <laughs> Oh, that so has a little salamander crossing issues that have been um, have been um, but I think very important um, I do think that we can trust our friends at the conservation commission to get, we're interested in that for sure but the conservation commission will need to be satisfied on that we're, we meet with them next week yeah. Uh, yes. If I may, um, mm -hmm. as far as the, the comments and the auto turn comment was raised by the, the peer review consultant, so um, in anticipation of the question, I, I did run the auto turn templates for okay. a couple no. of the movements. Um, I apologize, I don't have copies for everybody. Um, you can share that. I will, I will We're a continual group, yep. Okay. Yeah. Kobe, share. Yeah. So that just basically shows the bus is coming into uh, into the lot, into each bay, and then pulling out, showing that the entrance and the exit turning movements work, as well as pulling into each stall. So if there's a second bus there, the first one's not going to make it, right? Yeah. Oh, the first one just uh, space. No, the, the, I meant the, the, I guess the third. The turning. The first parking spot. If there's a second bus here, right, is that showing that it's not going to make it? Or, well, the second bus isn't going to park in the second spot. The second bus is if, if there's a bus there first, they're going to park in the are going to the idea. No, I'm talking about it. They're, they're going to stack. They're going to stack right. this way. But they, no, can, they, they can come in any order, though. You just, she said well, we're gonna, they, they're gonna, we're gonna have to work with the bus company. They're gonna have to. They're not gonna be able to just pull it anywhere because if it's if it's that uh, scattered, you're correct. It's gonna be. It's gonna be right. difficult. They're not gonna be able to put the right. same bus in the same location. Right. 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 That first right. bus has got to know that he's gonna go to right. that that spot. And this is providing that they hit. That spot exactly, right? If they if they're off yeah, by a and couple of feet, those, right? Yeah, and those I mean those those tunnels are a little bit a little bit conservative. Okay. Uh, as well. Thank you. Chair. Yeah. Phil, this is you, you good? You, you good? You well? Know? He's nodding. For he's those, nodding. For those good. of you at home, he's nodding. Okay. Another comment? Yes, but you have to come to the microphone, sir. I think the conversation that just took place, what interests me is during the winter, obviously the buses will move out of the spaces to go do their routes first thing in the morning. What's going to be done to clear the parking lot so the buses can get into the proper spaces to so leave the question that you're going My understanding, sir, is that the DPW prioritizes uh, the school property as an right, example. Right, it's a timing question. I understand priority. Mm -hmm. They'll have yeah. channels, but I'm, I'm yeah. assuming that once those buses have left the lot, you now have chaos of piles of snow left behind. And to your colleague's point, it's going to be quite difficult for buses to accurately hit those spots if there are random parts yeah, of snow. So, the, so I, I, I think to, like your point, to your point, I'm sure it's a challenge, but I'm sure it's a challenge they do in any school bus parking lot anywhere. They have to solve that, that piece in order for school to be held and our kids to get back and forth. So I, I leave that to the capable, in the capable hands of uh, the DPW and the school department. They're going to have to do that. You're right. Unless the design was changed to make it easier for them. Unless what? Sorry, the, the point you're making is that within the design, they have to work with it. The question to your colleagues, I think, was if the design is changed, would it be easier for them? They have to work with it within whatever design is put forward. Um, Gary, trying to pretty much everyone yes. speaks, speaking as a butter, not as a member of the planning board. Um, one other complexity in the snow removal that, that worries me further is that you always have vehicles there. So you always either have the buses there or you have the cars there. And we all know that trying to plow a lot when the cars are parked there um, creates a lot of challenges. And, I, and I, so, so while yes, this is a problem that exists elsewhere, I, I, I don't know how many schools actually have the bus drivers park in the same parking lot where the buses are being queued to, to pick people up. 
So I don't know if anybody wants to take a shot at answering the snow plowing conundrum. So I didn't introduce myself last time. I'm Tim Person, the director of buildings and grounds for the schools. Um, so we do work closely with the DPW on snow removal throughout the campus, and it's um, and I'm sure most of you have been up there. It's, it's pretty challenging as it stands. Um, I would suggest that um, if we had that much snow, we'd probably cancel school that day. So we would we would not have to deal with the um, bus driver cars. You know, we plow around those spaces. DPW would then remove the snow from the area uh, prior to school starting the next day. Uh, they've been good, they've been great to work with for the you know, last year that I've been here anyway. Um, so I trust that they would continue to do so. We also have equipment on site ourselves um, should we need help out in that manner, so. Thank you. Yes. I see they're asking for a waiver on the height of the lights. Are there any other waivers being requested? Uh, there's the landscaping waiver. Mm, what's the landscaping waiver? Um, the required lands. Sorry. Page four. Page four. Page four. I'm sorry. Of what? Uh, page four of the comment letter from okay. World Tech. So they're okay. requesting a waiver for the plantings. Oh, that's right. And also, you might have hard copies in front of you, too. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So it's the last page of yeah, the handout. All right. Just but it doesn't say much. I got extra one. Yeah, so, so Bill, maybe. Could they ask them to go over why they can't provide landscaping? Yeah, absolutely. Ask away. This, just for the public's information, this came today. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Amy. So can you just go over um, why you're requesting a waiver for the um, for the landscaping? They, you can't fit any landscaping in. So as, as far as the, the landscape, I, and I have a question as well, is what's the, the, the purpose of the landscaping given that the entire site around the perimeter um, is vegetated and, and tree? Um, so what, I'm just wondering what, what goal we're trying to accomplish with the, the landscaping. I understand if, if we're clearing a site, you're clearing trees, you're clearing lots, you want to put trees back. But where it's already a, a, a wide open, clear site, uh, we're wondering what the intent of the, the landscaping would be, number one. And number two, quite honestly, we have a, a fiscal restraint that we're up against this year, uh, which is kind of part two of that, of that answer. What's the, the, the restraint is what? Fiscally, <laughs> fiscal restraint. So you can't afford to do it? Um, we may not be able to. We may not be. We have, we have bids. The product's going to be publicly bid. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're, we're very tied up with that bid as far as uh, what the budget's going to be. Um, so at least at, at this time, we would like to seek a waiver if possible. So I can just answer. We talked about this at Design Review a little bit. Um, I think we were just hoping for the parking lot is going to be something you can see from the school building, from the cafeteria where the kids eat, and there's tables outside. So just if there were, could be any landscaping between like the building and the parking lot. That would be nice. And maybe, perhaps it could be a donation if you don't have funds. Um, so know. where that um, um, outdoor area is now, there already are. There, there are existing a, there shrubs and things. There is a perimeter of, of trees there. Okay. Um, so that outdoor seating area and what you see from the cafeteria already does have several trees that are there. Okay. So I'll drive by that again before. Um, or I guess I can't drive. I will walk back there. <laughs> <laughs> I think just before the next meeting. Maybe back on that point, but on the back side of it, right now, you're kind of coming around the loop road, right? So you're going clockwise on the loop road. 
when you come back around, you don't necessarily see the field itself, it's just an open area. You have some shrubs there, it's not, not, not trees per se, but it's kind of vegetation area. I think if you had some trees there, because now what you're just gonna have, you're gonna see a back, you're gonna see a bunch of buses, right? If I'm looking at it, if I'm thinking correctly. Or cars, but no, back there, it's just gonna be straight out back of the buses. To have some type of trees or shrubs or additional landscaping, you don't necessarily, or you wouldn't necessarily see those buses on the backside. You would just see that kind of wall, for lack of a better term, of some vegetation. Then you kind of look back on the road. Now, I don't think you die by looking at the back of buses, but you know what? It would, aesthetically, it would look better than just looking at the back of buses to add something back there. So from the loop road is your point, and also from the cafeteria. Okay. I, mean, I, I think it doesn't hurt any of us to drive out there and, and make sure. Um, I run it every day. Uh, so you run it every day, I so know, you don't I have to take an extra trip. I literally trip. know exactly what it looks yeah. like. Because yeah. I, don't, I don't particularly remember a bunch of trees. But there, there's, there's just a, a couple trees. at the very beginning, yeah. but then it's yeah. very open as, yeah. as, as field nine is open. Yeah. That's just an open shrubbery. And That's what I... Yeah. Right, because it's elevated. There's a there's a, there's a steep marks. angle. Yeah, it looks like a scrub. scrub. Yeah, a scrub essentially, but it's a steep angle from the, the street um, mm -hmm. up to field field nine. Mm -hmm. um, it's worth thinking about, um, and I we understand the the fiscal constraints for sure. Um, but it's worth thinking about doing if if it's possible to do it to make sure that there's some screening. Um, but we understand that you're requesting the waiver. Um, anybody have anything else before we can continue? Question about the process? Are we looking for a yeah, vote tonight? Yeah, go ahead. We're looking for a vote tonight? We're looking for a continuation. We don't oh, have freedom. everything okay. we need. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would like to do it tonight, but... Um, I just um, have one thing. Yeah. And uh, I'm just wondering if there's, and this is back to the lighting, any reason other than just keeping it consistent throughout the campus is there any reason to have it for 25 feet tall instead of 15 feet well the other the other thing too is if we go with a lower fixture we're probably going to need um, more light poles or more fixtures that's going to have to be required to not provide dark spots which is going to take up more space in that parking lot which may preclude the number of spaces that we need if that if that makes sense it, it does make yes. sense totally. yeah so is that is that definitely you know you say it may require? Well, well, I, I just want I, to. I'm not an electrical designer. Quite honestly, we have the photometrics that were submitted, but I think, and I will, I will, we will look at it. But I have a feeling that if we go with 15 foot lower fixtures, the light's going to be concentrated closer to that pole itself, and in between you're going to have darker areas that that Phil was mentioning before, and I we can't. I think you should double check that. Oh, so, no, absolutely. But okay. Thank well, you. And I think the follow-up question to that would be, how, if so, it sounds like intuitively you would need additional fixtures. Right. Right now you're proposing four. Mm -hmm. How many additional fixtures would be required to meet the standard area of lighting without creating those dark spots? So is it four going to eight, four going to six, four going to ten? Right. Well, if I can, if I can in, in interject here. Um, there are different types of lighting, so I think that if we did go with the lower lighting, you can put light about bollards, which are very effective as well, as long as they're placed appropriately, obviously for a, for a parking lot that's dense, it's gonna be a challenge, but there are different ways to light um, nicely and, and calmly to bring the lighting down for the neighborhood. We'll look at it. Thank you. All right, any questions from anybody before we uh, continue? So um, I'm gonna entertain a motion to continue this hearing to our um, meeting on July 23rd at 7. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Um, and if it's helpful, um, obviously the, the plenty of staff is always available, but I, I will also make myself available in between now and then if it's helpful on um, working the issues. Okay. Reminder to close the public hearing. Oh, sorry. I continue that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Right. I love the reminders. Um, 
She uh, punched out at 10 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also just um, want to make sure, I think that we have to appoint or reappoint our design review board members that night. Yes. We're going to be busy that night, everybody. And that one should be it should be very well. easy. Yeah. Um, what time should we do that? So we have 90 Hayden Row at 7 o'clock, Buckman at 7.30, Global 7.35, yep. Zach at 9.15, and then an update from Wilson Street drainage at 9.45. Uh, what is the, what about 52 South Street? Sorry, that's 830, 52 South Street, 915 zoning, uh, Zach. Zach, okay. 945 Wilson Street drainage. All right, so um, can we do, I mean, are people going to come? Have, have people responded to you? Or are people going to uh, come? Um, from the majority of the board members, I've heard from one that would not like to be. Does not want to be. Continue, no. Okay, so, but everybody else is interested yeah. in continuing. Um, and expecting to come, or you don't know? I did they come last year? Usually, it's been they the they yeah, they usually like it's, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, they don't usually come. I don't remember. Well, it's usually the only the right number of people for the right number of spots, so they've yeah. not usually come. Sometimes the chair has come, like Jeff already. Okay, yeah, I usually send an email asking, yeah. So, that's what I've done. So, I'll see if, if anyone's planning on attending, but it's really they've sent an email saying they'd like to continue. Right. Well, how about um, the only problem would be if we get more applicants than we have spots for, then it would take more time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And can I ask who's not going to return? Okay, do we know? I have it written down. I was just thinking that we try to think of somebody that might uh, fit. I can tell you. I want to. I'll tell you. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we put them on. Are you continuing? Yeah, but I'm hopefully being replaced by somebody else on the board. Well, I said, yeah. I said last time I would replace you, right? Yeah. yeah. We have taken care of the yeah, planning, planning board's board's also right. for the DRB. Yeah, so I'm sorry, who's not coming back? Oh, sorry. She has to look it up. So oh, don't. I don't know, I didn't know if we wanted to look I, it up I now. Was, somebody was distracting me. Yeah. <laughs> didn't follow the conversation. Um, okay. So um, I'm open to t uh, suggestions of how people want to handle that. Shall we? Um, does it have to be appointed in July? I couldn't wait till. Yeah. No, their term expires in August. on the 27th. Um, and when is their next meeting in August? Could we, could we do it at our first August meeting? Okay. Which is not till the 20th. 20 oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, so uh, I say we do it at 8. Uh, at uh, 9.05. Okay. Or 9. 9. Okay. 9. I was going to suggest that we switch the 9.15 and the 9.45 because I think the 9.45 was a public hearing and, and the 9.15 was the Zach. And I, we switched the order of those. So neither one of them are um, public hearings. Oh, okay. Person. Well, they're, they're just discussions. Okay. So. Fair enough. And we couldn't switch them if they were, because they've already been already set as a date and time. So that's the yeah, challenge. That's, that's the thing. I didn't know. What's that? How that worked? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So everybody, be prepared. Next, next uh, time. We do have, as a reminder, thank you. I had it on my list to uh, say, but I was forgetting to say it. We do have a meeting tomorrow with the selectmen mm -hmm. here at 6:50 to uh, interview and select. Um, Is it about five of them, I think? I saw four. 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 I saw four. Um, and it, well, could, could you be able to read some? I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Good. The list of uh, sample questions that we might ask, because last time several people dropped out and there wasn't really yeah, a, always a need to ask questions, but mm -hmm. I just want to make sure we're asking questions fairly and the same question to everybody applies. So we... Uh, we can't necessarily um, establish that process okay. ahead of time. I celebrate the idea, um, but people can ask whatever questions they decide to ask. But it okay. would be nice to okay. set it up. Yeah, yeah. guideline. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, just one comment too, and unfortunately I cannot be there tomorrow. I have a work engagement in Charlotte, so, um, but I just wanted to say that I think it's in good hands. Um, I look forward to hearing who ends up on the board, um, but I apologize. I just um, cleared my schedule on plenty of board meetings, but this one was added on and I, I just have to be in Charlotte first thing Wednesday morning, so. You know, your questions would be about biking here and got you covered. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm much deeper than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. I do have a note just for that. One of the applicants is not able to attend tomorrow. Um, Carol is not. I don't know how to pronounce her. Dever. Dever. Yeah, Dever. she's not Dever. able to attend. Tomorrow. So Carol Dever um, has worked, has served on the planning board before uh, and served a five-year term. So I just put that up there. Um, I'm disappointed that she can't come. Um, I think she'd make a, a great um, choice. Um, so and it, there isn't necessarily any reason we can't consider her, but that is also up to everybody who's there as an appointing member. Looks like um, one of your neighbors, right, Cameron? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, is there anything else that we are forgetting? I know we should do minutes quickly before we go, but is there anything else that we... Um, did you, do you have your notes easily? When we were talking, uh, I don't have the minutes right in front of me, but um, at the very end of the minutes, it was missing a conversation that we had have had about the lighting and signage, and we, could, and we discovered that the glass the glass wall was was um, protruding up behind one of the signs. This was for the global gas company, and um, we were I think we asked the question um, to the degree that the lighting would be mitigated um, by internal controls. Um, whether they, they were going to be able to dim the lights, and I think they said yes. Would you like to do me a favor and send that to me? Yes, I wrote it down. So. Yeah, so you yes. can send it to me, and I'll add it in where you want it. Okay, no problem. Because that was way over my head. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, okay. Yeah. Yes, no and problem. I, I, you know, I, I already I, put a lot in, and if it gets too complicated, I don't want to mess it up. But no, you no, this is at the actually just the last. Okay, if you just want to tell me where you would like that, and I'll add it. Check. Okay. Thank you, Colby. Um, if, are people comfortable voting the minutes with that pending correction? Mm -hmm. I'll entertain yes. a motion. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Um, thank you all for pushing through um, a little bit longer to, to help hopefully move the school forward on that plan. Um, I'll entertain a motion to close. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you all. George, thank you so much.